Welcome to this week's podcast. I'm Jorge. And this is Viv. And today our guest is... William. Yeah. So today we got William. He is our resident nurse. Um, so he heals and fixes up people and ourselves. And uh, we have quite an interesting topic. But before we start on that, how was everyone's week? You go first. How's my week? Yeah. yeah. So like Jorge said, I'm a nurse. I work at the Royal Alec Hospital, and I work currently in the infection control department. So basically, my work life is essentially COVID related, and that's pretty much it for like the past two years. Did you did you start this role before COVID? Yes, I did. So like it kind of exploded on you guys. Yeah, right? exactly. Like it was just like, like... before, like before <clears throat> COVID happened, we we're like dealing with outbreaks that are. Like organisms that are really not significant, like skin infections and stuff like that that we see, or like diarrhea, like people have normal virus and stuff like that. But then when COVID happened, it was like holy shit, all hands on deck. It was crazy. Yeah, long work days too. It was like uh, the oh shit happened in their department. Right? Actually, yeah. actually, yeah. No one was well. I mean, the it's running exactly joke was what you guys are looking for exactly. Yeah, he's like at first for the, like even one of my friends was was joking. That she wanted like a little bit of an outbreak, just a small one, just to stir things up because it was so stable for the longest time. And the running joke was, typically historically, it's like every ten to fifteen years we have yeah. a pandemic or an endemic, and we were like long overdue, we're, like seventeen years in, and we haven't had anything really big, like Ebola, sure, but that was like more localized mm -hmm. and didn't really make it into Canada except for one or two cases in North America in general. So then. When COVID happened, at first we we're like, "Yeah, this is what we live for. Like, this is our job. What's the, well, how bad can it be?" And then it, two years later, we're like all over it. Right now, we're like, we're, we're done. It, it's, it's like the one department the government doesn't fund too much, yeah. but they still need a <laughs> exactly. Budget. And then all of a sudden, they're like, "Oh, so you guys are our only hope." <laughs> exactly. All of a sudden, they just start throwing money at it. Exactly. And they're like, "We need this ASAP." Yeah. Yeah, job security is pretty good after this. Yeah. Yeah. For next little while too, yeah, right? Because exactly. you know, all the interesting cases. Like a week before was probably like maybe I should fire him. <laughs> <laughs> you could cut some people down. Yeah, not anymore. Uh, it's like before their their red button was all dusty and shit. And yeah, it, oh, yeah. And all of a sudden it flips open and right. they go all out. Exactly. Yeah, it was crazy because when it first started, I was uh, quite surprised because. Like, this is the first time it's happened in our lives, yeah, where you literally yeah. couldn't go somewhere no. because of this, right? I didn't even take it seriously like everyone else did in the beginning. You just think it's not a big deal. It's probably <clears> just going to last, like, a few months or something, but little did we know. Yeah. Well, I, I was in Japan mm -hmm. until like, mid-February. That was, like, two 20... months in, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so I think everyone got locked down March 2020. Yeah. yeah, I remember I was supposed to go to Japan like a week after him. Yeah. But then everything started getting canceled or yeah. closed. And I kept getting emails saying like, oh, sorry, this establishment is no longer open. Or this establishment is going to close. That sucks. So then last minute we decided to just not go. Because wow. there was too many things closing. There was nothing to right. do. Right, it's yeah. not worth it. You, you yeah. went really lucky. Actually, the time that you went, I was telling your sister. I was like, ooh, I don't know if... Like he's what if it, what if the order closes you know before you even get back we're, like were you not yeah. worried about that at all? I was not. <laughs> <laughs> I was there. COVID, what? It was it was weird because like I had to experience the whole mask masking thing before we did here. So there in Japan oh, right, it's right. so typical. So almost everyone wore a mask. Uh, so we all already wore a mask, but it was at the time where they didn't have that much tourism. Right. So this is like right before the cherry blossom season or whatever. Yeah, like, it's because we were yeah, trying to go. Yeah. To so the so the, the cherry season. blossoms were starting to bud, but they mm. weren't like full bloom yet. Mm. So there weren't many people there at all. Like you would see all these popular places and it's just us. And we're like, this is great. Like this is the best thing ever. We, we get this whole place to ourselves. And then I heard about the COVID thing, but like I said, we've never experienced one. So at the time I didn't know how severe it was actually going to get, right? Like, oh. like we've heard of Ebola and all that stuff and it was severe there yeah. but it didn't really affect our lives here or even when SARS was around it didn't, it didn't feel that bad everyone just wore masks and yeah. nothing happened essentially yeah. yeah. so then I was like well I don't know I'm not being called to go back yet I assume they'll give me some type of warning uh, but yeah I wasn't I wasn't really worried when I was there okay what I was worried about is I had not COVID 
I must right. have had like a flu or something. Uh-huh. 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 And when I went start. there, I was recovering from it. Oh, okay. Like pretty so much. So you're saying you transmitted COVID <laughs> from guys, First North case America Japan. to yeah. Japan? <laughs> I don't think that's believable. Maybe. Any uh, <clears throat> FBI agents listening to this podcast? You know who to arrest right here? Uh, a yeah. Global terrorist. <laughs> but yeah, I was like at the end part of my my sniffles. Let's call oh. it. Mm. And uh, pretty much on the plane, I was so worried to cough. I was like, I don't want them to check me for shit. So, like, I held in everything until I got into our Airbnb. And I was, like, coughing my lungs out as soon as I got into Airbnb. I was like, oh, finally, I can get all this fat ass stain on your forehead. Ready to <laughs> so, <laughs> it in. And then, and then near the end of the trip, coming back, um, I don't know. I felt like it was not really a stomach flu, but I felt, like, it wasn't mm. feeling all there, but it wasn't it wasn't related to my like respiratory system. Oh, but yes. I was like again, I was like, I don't want them to fucking like measure the shit out. Diarrhea of is also a symptom of COVID. All right. You know, <laughs> have you ever thought maybe, maybe I'm the one. Maybe COVID. I'm the one, guys. <laughs> maybe you're the one that started this. He's pandemic. the index case. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'm the one, guys. I did say during COVID, I was like, because during COVID, I had to work the whole time on site. Like, Your I patient much, zero. Yeah, I was like, dude, <laughs> if if there was like a super spreader, I'm probably the one, guys. Oh gosh. Um, I I followed all the rules, but it's just yeah, I don't know. Mm. Like at the time, you go to somewhere with a flu, you're just like whatever, right? Yeah. Like I don't know, you ever been been on va- vacation when you were a little sick or something yeah. before yeah, you went? That's yeah. true. But also, I feel like when you go on vacation. When there's like a major change of temperature, that's when I get sick. Like when I, when I come back from a hot place to a cold place or from a cold place to a hot place, I usually just like something acts up with with my body. And I don't know if that's a real scientific thing, but it feels like I'm trying to Sounds acclimate like to the. Bitch. <laughs> 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 Fuck up, <man. laughs> well, that doesn't happen to you ever. I don't. I don't recall that ever happening though. Oh. Do you not feel like kind of tired or lethargic when you're jet lagged? Probably tired and everything, but not yeah, sick. Yeah, that's kind of what I get too, is just yeah. tired. I feel like every time I came back from like a warm place to, to, to Edmonton, I just feel like shit. Oh, really? Yeah. And like, part of it is so maybe you're saying your immune system ain't that great either, hey? Come on, man. Interesting. <laughs> My immune system will fist fight your immune system right now. Wow. Let's bring it down. T cell to T cell. Let's go. <laughs> uh, anyway, so Viv, how was, how was your week? My week is okay. I started working out again after giving up the gym for like three weeks, and that felt amazing. I nice. got these new ear earbuds that cancel out noise way better than I thought any earbud could, and it, w- it was an amazing workout. That was the highlight oh, of my week for sure. Nice. That, oh. that, that, it's like you starve <laughs> <you> st- <laughs> not, nothing, nothing big, but you know. <laughs> you like starve yourself from that dopamine hit, and then all of a sudden, bam. I know. Nice. Nice. So nice. So nice. That's good. That's good. Uh, my week was good at work. It was busy, but uh, I'm excited because I get to go on another mini vacation next week. So that's one. fun. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, nothing that interesting. A lot of it nowadays is just like after work. It's I started a new workout routine, so that's fun. Uh, prepping for the podcast and doing all these little mini hobbies I do. Like I recently got a 3D printer. I spent a lot during Black Friday, to be honest. Yeah, it looks like it. I spent a lot. Like half of it was gifts, though. But the other half was that's splurging smart. on yourself, yeah, shopping. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Getting the gifts while it's Black Friday, or um, so this year my family Christmas party is after Christmas, so we can get in on the Boxing Day it. deals. You always have it around after Christmas. Yeah. Right? That's that's cool because we can get the, get in on yeah. those Boxing Day. Because I feel like okay, this year I felt like Black Friday was average. A dud. Yeah, it was pretty average. I didn't yeah. see any crazy sales or anything mm. I really wanted to yeah. buy. And then historically, I felt like Black uh, Boxing Day usually had the better sales, but last year I felt like they were B- Black Friday evil. had the better sales than Boxing Day. But I'm not sure about this year. Mm. But for me, I just buy like electronics and stuff, so those are like easier to track historically what prices are and stuff. I was thinking of building a new like PC lately for my whole podcast and stuff oh. like that. But man, those graphic cards are still no. expensive. Yeah, they're not even in stock. So hard yeah. to find. Yeah, so. I don't know. I have to give up on that. Using this potato for now. So I can think of something. So it works. So this week's podcast, we will be talking about debt. <sighs> uh, not... It may not sound like a cheerful... Actually, it's not. It's not a cheerful. Debt is not a cheerful topic. But we're gonna... 
this, this this was my thought process when I was discussing with Viv. It's a really dumb thought process. So Viv's been down lately from some you know personal issues and stuff, and I was like, you know what we should do? We should talk about death. It's depression <laughs> yeah, month. Perfect. Let's talk about death. Uh, but I like maybe closer to the end of the podcast, maybe you guys will see how I think of it, and maybe that's why you can kind of relate on how I thought it would be a fun topic to do and a bit of a cheerful one, even though there are some very sad moments. You think I'll put suicide watch on this? Guy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm not sad. I just enjoy talking. About- you guys, okay. So the running thing of the podcast is I want to live forever. So. I think this might be a weird topic to talk about. That is a joke to you. (laughs) 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 Ain't gonna happen to me. (laughs) Uh, With all the things I do, with the good sleep and breathing I do, no way. No way, no way. Alright, so with our resident nurse here, let's first talk about what actually happens to you when you die. So if someone is now, you know, physically pronounced dead. Okay, wait, one thing about that. So usually a doctor has to say that, right? Yeah, so obviously a doctor is not there to to see the patient at first. So a nurse or whoever first discovers the patient, we go in and we assess the patient ourselves. And if the patient doesn't have a heartbeat for longer than a minute, then we call the physician and say, hey, this, this patient is likely you know, deceased, but they still have to make the ultimate certification. So they do their whole assessment as well. They listen to the heartbeat for five minutes or up to five minutes, and then they essentially pronounce the the patient dead at that point. What if there's like an accident on site, on scene or something like that? Mm -hmm. How does that work? Can a paramedic do this or no? That's not allowed. I rarely do they I mean if it's very obvious that that yeah, person is like if dead they're like if they're decapitated <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. like they don't need someone Sorry, I gotta call the doctor yeah. to make exactly. sure you're we dead. still need to listen to the heartbeat no yeah. like yeah like that's not usually how it works but if there's an amputation or something that's traumatic then they still try to resuscitate them and, and bring them to the hospital before they before they pronounce them dead right uh, I think I was searching this yesterday I forget there were specific things they say that they don't need a doctor pronounced. I think one of them is decapitation. I think another one is like burn to beyond, like you can't even recognize, recognize them. them. Yeah, I forgot what the other ones are, um, but I'm curious on that. Maybe I'll search it up while you talk. So okay, physically, we have the resident nurse here. When we die and we're pronounced dead, what kind of happens? What's kind of the process and the steps of our physically, our body? So physically, after death, there is still some sort of brain. Um, activity so that's when your body you don't have a pulse anymore you don't have breathing and reflexes or pupillary uh, pupillary restrictions Um, and then you're essentially a pronounced absence uh, you're you're dead at that point but then there's still brain activities after about 10 minutes afterwards and that's just for reflexes and that's when your neurons are still in your brain still working so you still have like minor reflexes of someone blinking or even like fidgeting of person of, of a body part and then after that it's one hour um, afterwards you still have body relaxation that's when your feces and your orifices starts relaxing as well so your urine your feces are all flowing through at that point that's exciting uh, yeah <laughs> and then blood drained uh drained as in it pools so your top half of your body or I guess wherever side that you're lying on if you're lying on your back your back is quite like flush and, and red but then the top half is Whoa. everybody is now pale and pretty cool right. uh, so if you're touch. like on a glass table from under you, you would can see, like see red yeah you'll see like, like, like it's yeah it's not dark red but it's noticeably like tinted mm. with, with red um, and then afterwards two to six hours it's when um, your rigor mortis starts to set in so that's when you turn really really stiff um, and then thereafter seven to twelve hours is when it's the most stiff and usually at that time when nurses discover the body we try because for presentation if you don't kind of adjust a person post-mortem at that point before rigor mortis fully sets in it's really hard to adjust any body part so a lot of patients when they die their jaws are like wide open mm-hmm. so in at the request of family we often get asked to like close their mouth so we use a, a towel that kind of ties it a like ties Whoa. their jaws shut just before the rigor mortis completely sets in, and then we we relax the the towels so that they could kind of look more presentable for the patients and the families. A uh, towels like that Korean spa bun, right? <laughs> <laughs> is that the one? Exactly. Yeah, the one where yeah. you go I under the chin know. up to the top of your head, right? Yeah, looks like that V neck or V chin thing that girls put oh, on. Oh yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Like for a facial. 
And then 12 hours after that, your muscle begins to loosen, so it's more relaxing, but uh, you're at that point, your muscles are pretty tense still. Mm. Um, and then tissue decay starts to occur, and then thereafter, you're just brought to the, the morgue after that. Does your, does your limbs become brittle? Like, could you snap something off easily or no? No. Uh, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> thinking about cartoons. Your tissue and your <laughs> stuff is still, you know, like your tissue. I, I, I was going to ask a question later, but I was like, eh, it seems un- inappropriate, but what the hell? <laughs> I don't know. I, I was just thinking of cartoons. Not like a, you don't turn into a cardboard and, mm, no. I see. I see. Okay. That's, that makes sense. Oh, yeah. So, anyways, going back to our, what we were talking about before, uh, you can call death on scene if there's decapitation catastrophic brain trauma, incineration, severing of a body, or injuries that do not permit effective administration of CPR, or if, like, on scene, you're already at the rigor mortis stage, Mm -hmm. or if you're decomposing, which is kind of (laughs) obvious. Someone (laughs) Well, what if they found a body or somewhere, right? (laughs) They're like, oh, do we need a doctor for this? Nah, man. Uh, Man, this is a skeleton. There's flies. (laughs) Maggots coming out. Yeah. Uh, or, okay, this one's surprising. Identification of valid do not resus- resuscitate orders. Ooh. So that's probably in, like, palliative care? Yeah, palliative care where they usually... I mean, if when you're old enough to be in that stage or if you have a acute chronic condition um, or if you have, like, cancer and you're, like, imminently dying that's untreatable at a stage, then they ask you to review your goals of care. So your goals of care can range from being fully resuscitating. So they do full-on CPR with you. They give you all the drugs that they possibly can... <laughs> To bring you to ICU and try to resuscitate yeah. you, and then but usually the family likes to have that conversation with the patient so that you know they don't go through more, more trauma than than the actual resuscitation if it's not worth or from them deemed not worth uh, going through for their can you family members. You, you break bones when you do CPR and something. Yeah, like. you definitely crack the ribs, ribs oh, for right. sure. Yeah. So it must be crazy painful for that type of thing. Yeah, especially when it's not. I mean, <clears throat> when it's successful and it and they kind of still have a pulse at that point, they go to ICU. Um, even then, like, sometimes they might be, they might have a pulse, but they don't have brain activity because they have prolonged, like, deoxygenation in their brain. So there's no functional activity, but they're still, like, like living yeah. physically, I guess, with their organs. I have a kind of crazy story about this. So when I was working in the oil sands, I had some friends who were working on these tailing ponds. Uh, so these tailing ponds, pretty much through the oil sand process, uh, creates a lot of like this wastewater, and mm-hmm. and this shit's toxic, toxic as fuck, and they can't do anything with it. And it's just on the on the edge of the actual plant where they process these oil sands and stuff. So then there's actually a boat on there that I I don't know what their job is. I don't know if they're like cleaning stuff up or whatever. Mm-hmm. But they did a training with the people, and they said that you can sign a thing where if you actually fall in the water, you can sign a thing where they don't actually save you because by the time you actually come out you probably have so much toxins in your body that you're gonna die anyways holy shit oh. i was like so it's a waiver yeah oh. i was like yikes that's some shit right there yeah what toxins are in there no idea i didn't go into deep research on this stuff <laughs> at all but i was like no thanks for me i ain't going near those ponds mm-hmm. it's crazy because like these ponds to prevent uh, birds getting into these ponds and fucking themselves up and then transmuting to everyone, every other bird around, uh, they fire off these loud cannons every, like, X amount oh, of whatever. What the oh. And they have, like, these scarecrows around the pond and stuff, pretty much just to deter any animals. Because I think there was an incident one time. And since no one listens to this, I won't get sued. But I think there was an incident that the Alberta government got involved where a bunch of birds were migrating and they didn't... I think for whatever reason they landed in the pond oh, no. and they had to kill them all. Oh, really? No. Yeah. I was like, yikes, that's some toxic shit you guys are making. Oh, that sucks. Yeah. Wow. But you know, Alberta oil sounds are great, so. <laughs> great wrap up. Great yeah, great, <laughs> great wrap up. All right, cool. So now we know physically what happens after we die. Uh, usually the morgue won't get involved until plus 12 hours, right? Like, usually it's in the. No. Like, you, you mean like the patient going to the morgue? Yeah, yeah. So again, like if they have family and they and family request for them to see the body before they go to say their last goodbyes, yeah. then the units would keep the patient in their bed on the unit after they've cleaned them up because of the 
the orifices and, and stuff like that. Then thereafter, they go to the morgue. But if there's no family or if the family says, no, I'd rather not, and yeah. I'd rather see the patient um, after embalmment at the funeral home, then they just take the patient to the morgue. And then the bed just gets filled by another patient. Wait, it's like a whole operation. Wait, do nurses have to clean this thing? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah. Oh. Beg them, have you, clean have them. Have you done that? Before? Yeah. Oh. oh. Yeah. That's spooky. Okay, so... Do you have a question? I was going to say, the beds that people <clears throat> die on, do, you, do they just get reused for every other patient? Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. Like, you <laughs> literally oh clean God. it, you don't even hose it down. It's, like, as best as you can, you know what I mean? So before, hey, I know you came in for a yeah. broken pinky, <laughs> five people died on this bed before you. Yeah. Before you go on, the, before yeah. you go on the bed, you got to go, like, you moke, like, wi yeah. 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 on the bed, like, the whole Jackie Chan rant, where they yeah. try to get rid of the ghosts. Uh, yeah. Okay, so... Quick question, how soon after do they have to... So if you want to donate your organs, how soon after do they have to do that? So they do that before you die. So like you have to agree... <laughs> no, 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 but like for them to actually take the organs out. They're like, yeah, so yeah, yeah. like have they them. have to be like... If you're dead, like, yeah. like I said, like within... I guess... Like, are you saying, like, a, a person that volunteers to have their organs yeah. taken, like, knowing that they're going to die soon? Or, like, emergency comes in... No, like, like you know, there's a little on the back of our healthcare card or something. You donation, can, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, do they do it like after you die though, or or how does that work? It's before you die. It's like before you like are pronounced dead. Yeah. So you're. So like you're still like you're medically in a coma, and they're in taking. In most cases, yeah. And they're harvesting you. Yeah. So oh, like they're oh. so the so there's two. The bigger hospitals in 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 our city do the organ transplant. Yeah. So it's called the Hope Case. <laughs> okay. I think it stands for Human Organs Procurement. I don't remember what Edmonton. the E stands for. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but it's across Canada. But I was gonna sure. say extraction. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, maybe. Edmonton. But yeah. But essentially, what happens is a patient that's pronounced brain dead. Yeah. They the family member can go through the process of um kind of either volunteering the uh the deceased person or about to be deceased person to have their organs donated so as long as they have that card saying that they do like agree to that Mm -hmm. then they get wheeled into the um or and essentially i've been to two like cases where they've harvested the entire body like so it's like kind of rotations of of physicians and surgeons going in to extract whatever they need so they do skin grafting so parts of the skin cornea they do veins and and uh, arteries and then obviously the main organs hearts lungs kidneys liver there's still a carcass left right there is there oh, okay. yeah. yeah okay but it seems crazy because they're doing everything right? they do everything like eyeballs yeah but this whole time the machine is like running to like keep like some blood circulating oh. within the area but as soon as they start cutting open they only have a set amount of hours right. in some cases i've seen like took six hours for the full harvesting right. and then there's a whole orchestra <laughs> of like helicopters coming in having delivery and they just go to to the to the um airport and that that just gets flown to the next uh because that's biggest be, city that's needed as we ice right away and they just go yeah so some to... some actual like there's a, a machine that keeps the heart from like kind of uh, shrinking yeah. so it, it's continuously pumping but yeah. it's out of the body obviously oh yeah damn no wonder organs are so expensive <laughs> she oh, sold it wait market. so how accurate is squid game what do you mean you know have you watched squid game yeah and you know how they harvested or okay spoiler oh, alert guys very... the spoiler alert like like time ta- like ta- timing wise were they about right in yeah i mean, it, oh, I mean okay. they did as soon as they could yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah. then but like, the whole procedure but the whole procedure yeah like yeah. that's wild the way that they well, did it the tv show that's what he is <laughs> <laughs> all right cool now we know now we know what happens do the bodies after the organs are all taken out and everything's taken out with the skin and everything does it look like oh. the person's just well the the chest cavity if they do harvest anything in the chest cavity that gets put back together uh-huh. and then if they do skin grafting they try to not do it on areas that are visually unappealing obviously so like they, the, butt like the butts the legs the thighs the arms um they do in those areas so even when it's clothed you don't 
know that that person went through okay. the procedure itself. So. I wonder if they use like the more amateur doctors for that surgery. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like this is a practice run. Right? They're kind of like the students. tight for time. Yeah, I feel like they would use someone that's really good. No, and no, quick. no. But like the the last part. Oh, the, like the, the, the putting everything back together. Yeah. So because they're they're kind of you know they're not that rushed at that point. Yeah. It's not that urgent. Right? So like in your okay, donation card, you can actually thing. pick whether you want to just do organ donation or you want to do it for. Um, teaching purposes or oh. like a medical like cadaver like you can actually specifically say what you prefer and what you don't want and then they'll respect oh, that's that awesome. i was actually gonna ask something quite related to that have you guys seen body works at Tell oh yeah. yes that was a few years really ago cool. so, yeah, that was really so cool. how soon after death did they have to do all that stuff? i have no idea but that's crazy that, hey. yeah that's... so so if, if listeners are wondering body works is an exhibit that happened at uh i think it was it's probably all over the world but they pretty much take slices of a human body or horse or other stuff and they encase it into some type of is it glass or like yeah. resin. resin or something yeah, resin. just so people can see what like pretty much a cross section of a human body or animal is i watched a documentary on these people that wanted to <laughs> graph the entire circulatory system so they had to make sure that certain certain fluids were going in a certain way for your veins and your arteries so they could differentiate the two and it took months so I'm guessing body works took a long time for each uh, each display case. Mm. Probably took a very long time. Because it, it took them months and months and months to do the circulatory system. They made bank, man. That was like 40 bucks a person. It was probably worth it. It was probably worth it. Those were science, right? <laughs> but yeah, I was I, cause when I went to it, I went with my parents. Because I think I was still in high school when it was here. Mm-hmm. But I thought it was, like, worth it completely. Like, the amount of... Oh, okay, the craziest thing I thought was when they did the horse. Yeah. Like, the whole oh. horse. And I was like, that's insane. I, I guess maybe a bit more s- easier to sacrifice than a human, but still, like, <laughs> that was crazy. Because <laughs> it was, like, a full-size one, yeah. too. Yeah, you could see like everything. Stallion almost and so big. Y- you see, like, the muscles and stuff, and I was like, mm-hmm. that's crazy. That's really cool. That's crazy. Yeah, those exhibits. Uh, whoever... I just thought, can you imagine if there was a serial killer that became a scientist and he was like, oh, I'm going to create body works. But then all the people in the exhibit were actually his murder victims and no one knows. That's but he did dope. it for science, though. So oh, okay. <laughs> Wait, is... So, and made money. So it's fine. <laughs> wait, hold up. No, wait, that's not Dexter's. I've never watched Dexter. Dexter murders murderers. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Not for science. Okay. It's not for science. But he's a physician, though, I think, in that show. Like, oh, the Dexter is a physician. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what I remember. Cool. Okay. Now we know physically what happens. And we had our resident nurse uh, teach us some things, Viv. So mm-hmm. now we're educated. Uh, we want to talk about a little bit about death in different cultures. So Viv and I did a little bit of research on each culture. We'll touch base with it. Uh, I apologize in advance if any of these are inaccurate of any sort, just because this is just us briefly going on the internet. So whatever yeah. Google gave us, uh, blame them. <laughs> <laughs> Not us. We just took we just took whatever we got from from the good old Google. Uh, do, do you want to start with one, Viv? All right. So I looked up on Asia, and generally in Asia, Asian cultures, everything's around the same. There's not much differences aside from little details here and there. For example, in Chinese culture, when there's a funeral, everyone wears white as opposed to black. In Western cultures, people mostly wear black to mourn the dead. It's a color of death. But Chinese people believe white is the color of death. And then it depends on how old you are. But people who are older than 80 can wear red, even though red is the color of happiness and luck and prosperity. Wait, it's... the person that died or the people attending? Attending. Oh, the person that died will okay. be in case. Usually they have a. <clears throat> what's it called? A viewing. And yep. they're usually all dressed up and they look nice. Open and, casket. Yeah, open yeah. casket yeah. viewing. Yeah, they look nice. nice. They're all dressed up in like traditional Asian Asian clothes and there's flowers everywhere. But the people who are attending usually wear white. Aside from like the really elderly people, sometimes they'll wear red. Just as a ceremonial type of thing. They won, right? They're like, <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> I passed and they did it, right? I thought it was more for like the red symbol like for the elderly like generations wearing red is to ward off like superstitiously to ward off any spirits or bad spirits when you're attending funerals because it's like bad ominous oh. to go to a funeral when you're old because oh, yeah. it attracts death and right. that's why you die. So uh, maybe that's probably it too, like just for 
yeah. culture. The whole humor going on there. I yeah. also heard that from like my parents whenever they would go to funerals. Sometimes they wouldn't go to a specific funeral because they would think that like, oh, I have an event coming up this week, and then yeah. those spirits right. are gonna follow me. It's gonna be yeah. bad luck, so I can't go That's to right. both events. Like weddings and, and yeah. funerals. Birthday yeah. too, right? Yeah, like, yeah. If yeah. birthday's too, really yes. close. You don't want to go to the funeral, yeah. so then yeah. because something's gonna like follow you or yeah. Yeah. yes, or yeah. like stay with you for a few days to a week mm. or something like that. Mm. Yeah. A lot of Asian cultures burn money. Fake money, fake money. It's not, yeah. not illegal. <laughs> not fake, <treason>. money. <laughs> fake money, fake gold, fake paper clothes and paper or cardboard. Cardboard assets like furniture, couches, have you, small little cars. Have, have you seen these before? Yes. Some are yeah. insane. They, they are. Crazy. Like, like when my grandpa passed away, it was a whole suit, like a paper yeah. suit. Yeah. A paper Louis Vuitton stuff, yeah. a paper the mansion, like computer, yeah, toy yeah. cars, and yeah. like little yeah. Polly yeah. Pocket looking house yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah, paper everything. Like I, I remember my brother had a running joke. It's like they're burning all this money, but then it's gonna cause so much inflation in wherever they yeah. go because they're gonna get too much money, That's but they're right. just like making money, so everything's gonna cost more. Yeah, the so fake you... monies are in like denominations of like yeah. tens of millions. Yeah, yeah. Like it's crazy. Yeah. So then the only logic is you have to burn more, so yeah. they get even more. <laughs> <laughs> just keep burning. Apparently, in Buddhist cultures, the morning can only last forty nine days. This was a fun fact that I remember. Forty nine days because they believe. That within after forty nine days your soul will get reborn, and mm. that's where reincarnation starts after forty nine days. So you have a limited amount of time for how long you can be sad for. Yeah, this this number is very not not the forty nine, but around the yeah. forty mark is pretty consistent with a lot of religions. You know, mm. I'll, oh. I'll, we'll, we'll explain oh. that later. All right, yeah. Yeah. fun fact: there is obviously burning of incense, <clears throat> which is pretty classic. There's a lot of white and yellow flowers. Yellow flowers are pretty common, from what I found. I did a general research because marigolds are supposed to be a flower of death. Oh. They represent death, apparently. I was hoping it wasn't because of, like, skin color. (laughs) 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 What's that supposed to be? I don't know. (laughs) Wait, okay, hold up. Before you continue, do you... Okay, so me and Jorge and Will were both Buddhists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Do you know what the incense is for? So, I was raised Buddhist because my parents are really Buddhist. Yeah. And my whole family is. But I just follow what they do oh, in a okay. way. And I believe incense are used to like for prayers and stuff. It's like feeding, right? It's, it's, like it's feeding, the food yeah. for the spirits. It's food for the spirits, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So like we are... are We're essentially yeah. kind of giving them something to eat. Yeah. So, so, so like, as, a, as a respect. Yeah. 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 So our monkey brain, we can't interpret that. So that's why we put like food and stuff when we do the prayers. Uh-huh. Uh, but in real, in like the spiritual world, they eat the incense, which is why we burn the incense, yeah. and then we use the food afterwards to cook and eat ourselves. Yeah. But because our what? monkey brain can't understand that the <laughs> the spirits don't want the food, but we want to like present it. <laughs> monkey brains. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Growing up, whenever I had to burn incense at a temple, my parents always told me to pray or say something to it, and yeah. then you you're supposed to hold the incense, yeah. you pray, you bow a few times, and you put the incense in the thing. So yeah. I always assumed the incense was like a way of sending a message. <laughs> like a smoke <laughs> signal? <laughs> like exactly. Like you burn it, it's like, alright, now sing this your prayer, saying, and then yeah. when you put it down, that's where your message goes. <laughs> You're like, do a native smoke signal where you take like a blanket out, and you just start like fanning the smoke. It's blowing my mind that it's supposed to be food. <laughs> yeah, it's food. It's food for the spirit is wow. what it's for. Okay. <laughs> Because sometimes my mom would, she would have these traditions where you'd have to use the incense and you'd walk around the house and do certain things. You like bow to the front door, bow to a certain window or something. And I always thought it was to tell the, my mom always said there's like spirits coming in the front door. So I always thought it was, I'm using this incense as like a way to talk to you guys. That's why we lit it. I'm going to go over to the front door and I'm like, hey, don't come in. (laughs) (laughs) Go over to here. Hey, don't come in and go all the way upstairs and stick it in like the Buddha's little pot and be like hey so these are this is what i said (laughs) you heard me right (laughs) i'm not familiar but i'm actually thinking about this logically right now so if i had like a dog spirit or something around and i want to lure him i would lure him with the food to go to the main place where i'm praying to oh or like learn and then you light the thing and you send him your message (laughs) exactly Exactly. And, and then they eat the message oh my god yeah anyways 
And in Buddhism, there's always, there's most of the time an altar mm -hmm. where you will have a photo of the person who's recently deceased. It will be surrounded by fruit and sometimes candles and lights and pictures and gifts. And there'll be chanting, like what you've heard yeah. or hey say a few times, but that's more towards ghosts. <laughs> you would not say that yeah. at the funeral. No, that's, that's just Jackie Chan Adventures. <laughs> And in Korean culture, something that I found was that was interesting was their funeral and after death ceremonies vary widely depending on your economic status. Oh, so like the North Koreans get nothing? Um, <laughs> <laughs> or what? Yeah, well, let's pick up a piece of grass. <laughs> but it sometimes like the very basic ones, the Koreans would just go to the funeral home and look at the picture of the deceased person after everything's been done. You don't really have a whole ceremony or anything because they just can't afford it. Versus people who are more wealthier, they'll have a whole banquet book, there'll be a crap ton of flowers everywhere, they'll have wreaths set up. Right. And then gifts that people commonly bring would be a whole bunch of wreaths. Wreaths with a whole bunch yeah. of flowers and a name. I think that's, that's similar to similar most to cultures. Yeah. Most mm -hmm. other cultures okay. too is the wreaths. Like the, the, the circular flower yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. And then there's oh. like a name that comes down the middle or something. Mm -hmm. or yeah, something yeah, yeah. Like that. yeah. Yeah, and then they'll have like a big, big ceremony, and everyone will wear traditional clothing, but it just varies. Wait, quick note on the Chinese one uh, or the Buddhist one. So I, I've had some death in my family. I think Will has been to a lot of those mm -hmm. ceremonies, but th those last like a week for us. Yeah, like it'll be a week. Like literally for a whole week. If it's someone really close for a whole week, I would go to the funeral home almost every day for a week. I, I, I think more it's than a week, day? almost like ten days. It feels it like. Was we went to the funeral home for like almost a week and then we went to the temple yeah to like pay our respects like yeah. pretty much every week right like yeah. for seven, so okay so for, for us seven weeks, let's, let's share my experience so when someone really close like when my grandpa passed away mm -hmm. uh first of all the first day was dependent like we didn't just do it like we picked a specific day so we almost waited a whole month before we actually started the whole process it's like an auspicious date awesome right yeah it's like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the whole process of, like, I swear, I was at the funeral home for, like, 10 days, it felt like. It felt like I was there almost every day for 10 whole days. Like, pretty much after school, go home, eat a little bit of food, go to the funeral home. Oh. And then, um, this is a slightly shitty part. I was vegetarian for, like, six months, I think. That's the shitty part that you or remember? Well, <laughs> no, okay, sorry. Was that you had to eat vegetarian food? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how long was perspective is a little bit skewed here? Was it three months or six months? Okay, I think it was three months, right? I don't remember. Oh, but yeah, well. it was messed up because it was so close to Chinese New Year, so it ended up being four months of vegetarian. Oh no. Oh. It was tough. Man. It was tough. It was tough. But yeah, so that's just from my experience of the few times it's happened. And then in Buddhism, it's common for cremation. Because hmm. I think they're they just don't have enough land, right, to bury. Well, no, I think okay, I could be completely talking on my ass, and maybe the my population brother... is so dense. Do you think that they would have room? Oh for no, burial I think though? I think my brother will probably correct me later on. But I thought that certain holy Buddhist people, like certain people, are very enlightened. When you cremate them, oh, it yeah. doesn't fully mm. burn, mm -hmm. and there's little pebbles left. Yeah. And our temples actually keep those pebbles and put them in a, like a really sacred jar. Yes. But in general, we always cremate the people for whatever reason. But I think that was one part of it is the whole like pebbles or whatever Chaining remaining mm -hmm. after the cremation. Because cremation, they like, don't they, like they pretty much burn until there's nothing, right? Yeah. It should, should just be ashes. Ashes, yeah. But then sp specific enlightened Buddhist monks have like full rocks remaining. Mm-hmm. No, that could be something else. That could just be like something they swallowed, or I don't know. But, <laughs> but yeah, that's that's pretty cool. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay. So sorry then, to interrupt you. Moving on after right. Korea. In the Philippines culture, apparently wakes are held for days, but that's also very common in all of Asia. Mm -hmm. And I was just looking up something. What's a wake? When like, the body's there. Oh, the viewing. oh, that's what's called. Yeah, that's yeah. what's called. Okay. So I was—I remember seeing this documentary a long time ago. I have a bad—I'm really bad at regurgitating information that I know. But I remember watching this documentary a long time ago where 
there's a culture somewhere in Asia that hangs coffins on the side of their mountain. It's like a town and they hang their coffins on the side of the mountain. And one day a year, they'll bring all those coffins up and they'll take the bodies out and they'll parade them all around town. I heard about the same thing. Yeah. I forgot they'll where. They'll dress them up and get them all ready. And just on a quick, quick look on Google, there could be other cultures that do this too. But the Philippines do this apparently. The I. I-G-O-R-O-T people. They practice an ancient ancient burial ritual where the elderly carve their own coffins and the dead are hung on the side of a cliff. Indonesians also, I think. Mm-hmm. Just from quick Google search. Yeah, I thought that was pretty neat. That's and then crazy. One day a year, they'll bring the dead up. They'll decorate them and get them dressed. They'll clean them up, clean the corpses up, and they'll parade them around town. I wonder if they embalm well, them. I don't think they... Do you think they do? No. I actually, I don't think they have the resources yeah. to embalm. So, is it just stinky? Just, or? I guess so. I guess it's probably just, some like, stench. Yeah. I always heard death smells pretty fucking bad. <laughs> well, maybe they're used to it if they have this tradition every year. Yeah. Okay, wait. Before you leave from the Asia, I actually randomly searched one up. Mongolia. Mm. So, Mongolia has a celestial burial. This is kind of cool. So what they do is they take the person, they put them in a fetal position, they wrap them up with some type of cloth or some shit. Okay. Um, and then there's like some celestial or whatever proceeding, right, where they do this stuff. Then they unwrap them and they chop them up. Oh my god. And they feed them to the vultures. Oh yeah. I was like, whoa! Oh, I remember why? seeing that too. Uh, it's like their way of going back to nature. Like that's mm-hmm. where the body belongs. Giving back to God. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. like, the body belongs to be back to nature. And then they actually mix some parts of the body with like actual food because they don't want the vultures to like leave a little bit left. Mm-hmm. So then they make sure like all of it gets eaten by the vultures. Jesus Christ. And like, I don't know if you remember from my other podcast where I was like, like I was scared of the really big bird. Yeah. Dude, vultures are huge. <laughs> I like, remember when I saw them at the zoo this one time, I was like, there's no way that's a real bird. <laughs> They're so big. It looks like, it looks like a joke. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, until you actually stand next to it. Okay, what's the vulture wingspan? Vulture, okay, a small vulture wingspan is 1.3, 1.7. 7 meters. meter is like wow. my height in wingspan. A big one, a red-headed vulture. These are the ones in cartoons. Mm-hmm. You know, the fucking scary ones. 2 to 2.6 <coughs> meter wingspan. Holy cow. Jesus, that's like fucking Shaquille O'Neal. How tall is Shaquille O'Neal? <laughs> <laughs> how, how tall are they? Wait, hold up. I have to know how tall Shaquille O'Neal is first. Uh, he is 2.16 <laughs> meter. The sm- small, the smallest, the smallest red-headed vulture wingspan is the Shaquille length of Shaquille O'Neal. O'Neal. Yeah. That's insane. Shaquille O'Neal, that's if you're crazy. listening right now, lay down on your yeah. bed and that's how big the wing- wingspan Wait, is. Wait, were you asking? You were asking <laughs> how, you how tall they were or something? <laughs> uh, you want to deduce from a picture or you want me to scientifically find this out? How can we deduce from a picture? I don't know. Like, no a small iPhone and we're going to have to do the math. Fucking, uh, let's see. Let's see. Red-headed vulture size. They're going to come up with wingspan, aren't they? Oh, medium-sized vulture is 76 to yeah. 86 centimeter in length. So they are double their wingspan of their height. Wow. Wow. So imagine, yeah, 86 centimeter and then two. They're more than double. Two, two meters compared to 0.86 meters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. They're more than double their height and wingspan. Dude, that's crazy. I'd be so scared. Like, it would stand there, and at first I'd be like, oh, that's cool. And then it'll open up its, <laughs> its wings, and I would be like, oh, guys. <laughs> I, I saw our in front of me. I would not think, oh, that's cool. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, but still, like, size-wise. Like, something mm-hmm. that's 86 centimeters tall, so that's, like, less than half your height, probably. Yeah. You'll be like, oh, okay. I could probably fuck it up. And then it <laughs> opens up its wings and you're like, Mom. oh, shit. What's the, what's the famous cartoon that has both? Uh, pretty much almost all all cartoons with like death. Tunes? Like Looney Tunes yes. has one, yeah. Does it? Let me see. I'm just curious now. Looney Tunes. The and two vultures. Vulture. <laughs> two asshole vultures. Yeah. Oh, there's like a family vulture that hangs out with Bugs Bunny. Beaky oh. Buzzard is the name. <laughs> what the? I don't oh. remember that. Where am I imagining? There was in some cartoon. There's two vultures that are like really mean. Is that Lion King? Uh, there is a bird that's 
mean in Lion King, but... These two you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Okay, so I just searched up cartoon vouchers if anyone's curious. Where are they from? Is this a meme or is this for real? Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Oh, oh I, see. I see. Don't remember them. Oh, very... Dude, look look at this one. The Jungle Book vouchers. They look like idiots. <laughs> Like, how falsely advertises this? Because this guy thing with will... blonde hair looks like he's from Zookeeper. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, that's false advertisement because these things will fuck you up. You know what? Okay, this is a bit off topic, but how crazy is that we have these cartoons that make, like, like Winnie the Shits, Winnie the Pooh. Yeah. It's, like, all cute and cuddly. <laughs> all cute and cuddly, but if you actually saw a fucking bear. In real life. Wearing a t-shirt. Holy shit. <laughs> Wearing a t-shirt. <laughs> oh my Jesus. god. One, that bear's probably smart because it made a t-shirt. Or found one and could put it on. And two, bears are huge. Oh yeah. yeah. Bears are ginormous. Like okay. What kind of bear is Winnie the Pooh supposed to be? Oh, let's see. They vary oh, honey, in sizes. Yeah, honey bears. <laughs> <laughs> honey bears. <laughs> Wait, don't. <laughs> don't, 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 don't. Wait, no, look it up, look it up. <laughs> He's an Asian bear because he's yellowish. Um, Teddy bear. What the <laughs> fuck? What the heck? He's so uh, let's see. Teddy bear. He named the cub Winnie after his hometown of Winnipeg. Ooh, Canada, sweet. What the heck? Um, this sounds like they're just degrading bears here. Oh. Like, okay, do you guys know of, uh, what's the place, the most northern city in Manitoba where there's polar bears there all the time and they have to bring guns around them? Is it Churchill, Manitoba? Okay, let me see, let me see, guys. So, guys, I'm just trying to find, if you guys know, put in the comments, but... Yeah, I think Churchill in Manitoba has the most polar bears where they would... I think they have the polar bear jail. I don't know if you guys heard about this in the news. There's like a polar bear jail. So if a polar bear oh. comes too close to town, they put them in jail for a night and then they, like, <laughs> the they shoot them off. Okay, let's see. Let's see if I can find Polar oh, bear jail, Manitoba. Oh, Churchill, Manitoba, polar bear jail. Yeah. It's a legitimate <laughs> polar so bear cute. jail. So if the polar bear gets too close to town, they, they put them in this. What and are then they, they trying to them. do with this? They're like, you've learned your yeah. lesson, Jerry. Don't come back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think in this area... Polar bears are like the equivalent of kangaroos in Australia. Oh, where they're man. just like, Pests. yeah, like fuck off, like we just want to live type of thing. Uh, so then apparently, like everyone there has like a rifle in their car and stuff because there's always a polar bear around and stuff. And they all, I think all the dogs have some device that make a really loud noise. Oh. Like, so if you're walking a dog and all of a sudden polar bear shows oh. up, it'll activate something to scare the polar bear away. But regardless of polar bear, bears in general are fucking scary. Yeah. And like the way some of, Mostly Disney, right? Like, like Lion King. Like lions are fucking scary. Oh, yeah. Like I remember before I went camping this one time, I wanted to see what because you know when you go camping, you obviously have the risk of getting attacked by a bear. Yeah. I wanted to see how dangerous bears were, so I watched a whole bunch of videos of bears mauling people and like killing Dude, people. And I was before like, you went. Yeah, on... before I went camping, <laughs> you you gotta prepare yourself for the worst circumstances, right. you know. Okay, so, That's so scary. what so made me? Videos of so scared of bears is not even something fictional. It's some uh, no, sorry, not even something real. Uh, Chronicles of Narnia. Oh my gosh. Okay, what's the Chronicles of Narnia polar bear scene? There's a there was a scene. It was it in uh, which book is it? I forget which is dwarf was mentioned. I, okay, I forget. There was a movie. There's a movie out of the Chronicles of Narnia, um, and there's a polar bear fight. Between two polar bears. I've never actually watched Chronicles or not. Okay, me neither. Okay, so I have complete no spoiler alert. Doing. One of them was fighting the other one, and the one won, and how he won was like, you know, they go through the typical TV show fight, you know, a little Hustling struggle this way, yeah, a little yeah. bit of the anime comeback, and then all of a sudden the bear just whacks across the face of the other bear, <gasps> and the jaw just comes out. Huh. Not even real. And Wait, ever I since thought... then, I was completely <laughs> afraid of bears. I was like, these things are murderers. Wait, I thought Chronicles of Narnia was a kid's show. Uh, I saw blood. Huh? Yeah, Chronicles of Narnia. Here, let's I see. I thought it was like magical and about animals which, and doors. It's, uh, okay, which what's, what's movie? What's it rated? Uh, I don't know which one it is. It's not. It's not the lion. Oh, is it the wine and the witch in the wardrobe? Okay, let's see. Chronicles of Narnia movie, polar bear fight scene. Yeah, there was a legitimate bear, and it was fighting this ice queen person's bear. Like, there was an alpha bear, and there's the other bear. 
And this fictional bear scared the fuck out of me about bears. And I wasn't that young, but I was like, whoa, can that really it's happen? Like and then, no, no, no. <laughs> I, was, I was actually wondering, like, can this actually happen? So then I, like, Google, like, how, like, how strong bears are. And apparently, um, like, when bears hunt, they swipe the back of the animal's back, like a deer, and it'll oh. break their back. Oh, oh, wow. And then that's how they hunt and stuff. Like, their jaws oh, are also God, really strong, too. But they're, like, they're so strong and stuff. It's scary. I don't know. Like, they don't realize how scary bears are. I mean, any big animal is pretty yeah. scary, I feel. Well, I'm not scared. Well, okay. Say it. Like, say a it. A giraffe. Just scared of. A giraffe looks like a fucking idiot. All right. Like just so if we ever go to the zoo, I dare you. I triple doggy dare you to go into the cage of a giraffe and start fighting it. It's not going to do anything. Okay, okay. I'm not saying it's not. You know when they fight with their heads? Yeah, I know. They, like, but whip yeah. their necks around. But, but I think a giraffe is just as scary as a horse. Like a horse, horse scary, though. A, a horse can kick you and yeah. like kill you, right? But I don't think they're any more like even though they're a lot bigger than a horse, I don't think they're any more scary than a horse because like everything from like below neck to like top of the neck is like feels like useless. <laughs> like it's only for fighting other giraffes. Yeah. Like they're not gonna come swinging down with their neck at me, <laughs> right? She has like a really big. They're too small of a to target, hit. anyways. I feel like. The, the, next. the draft would just miss. Yeah. Oh, sure, too. I was gonna say the next a pretty big target. Oh. <laughs> but I'd be I'd be terrified of a hippo. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. But draft not nah, draft not so much. Draft just they just feel like idiots. Like I don't know. <laughs> like it just feels like they just got dealt with the retards in room of the, of the, of the safari. <laughs> but then they just became so big that no one fucked with them. Oh man, why's my neck so long? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, uh, sorry we got off topic there talking about animals, but you know animals and death—that's that's pretty cool too. You know, they, it, it's crazy because our life and death cycle here has probably stretched so much. But in an animal, like you can go just like that, right? Like, could you imagine the stress they feel all the time? Like a rabbit, a rabbit in the wild. Like how stressed is it? I know. Because like any minute it could just startled. fucking die. Yeah, whenever I see any stray animals, I'm like, oh man, did yeah. you when was your last meal? Where yeah. do you sleep at night? Yeah, but it's crazy because like if humans were on that, like I feel like humans' brain you could only develop. No, no, no. Oh, oh. I don't. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, maybe in some crazy place, <laughs> but I think I don't think the homeless people here are like thinking they're gonna die like just like that. Like, but the winters. The chances yeah. are a lot lower than a rabbit dying in the wild. But anyways, my my thought is. What if the human brain could develop because we're not in this hyper stress state all the time? Like maybe they're not hyper stressed, but maybe those are the ones that dies faster, you know? Because oh, they're not true. they're not attentive, right? Mm-hmm. But the ones who survive, the ones who make it, those they must be like like flicker on all the time. Like light switch on, they're always ready to like not die, right? Because that's all wa- never fully like survival when instinct. They yeah, like that's yeah, all that's they- heightened, right? You know what's crazy too? Like think about fishes. You're like you're in the fucking like okay if you're a, if you're a monkey you can climb to the top of a tree if you're a rabbit you can hide somewhere in the bushes you're a fish you're in the fucking open all the fucking time yeah that's true right like can you imagine like being a well, actually, actually in the sea or an ocean you know yeah. you're gonna hit the yeah. floor you can't hide somewhere yeah. you just have to find some big open area and be like I think this is good for the night <laughs> or even then like just think about like the asshole octopus that just comes out of nowhere and just grabs you from the bottom, oh, right? Yeah. That's for a sec, for a second, I was gonna think like, can you imagine being a tuna and like just like, you know, fucking someone ready to, like make you sashimi any day? And then I just thought about it. they're actually really big, so I don't know how much they actually Tuna's fear. Are huge. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how much they fear other fishes that much. I feel like the bigger you are, the more advantageous it is for you, right? Mm-hmm. Like no one's gonna fuck with a kraken or anything like that. A, a, a what? <laughs> a kraken. Or <laughs> kraken. I was like, what kraken? oh, that too. <laughs> Right, like no one's gonna fuck. Yeah, but like, I saw a kraken and yeah, someone fuck, fuck with him. Yeah. Like, like the wild is not like prison. They don't find the biggest thing and try to fight it. Right, like, like they just like okay, that thing's bigger than me. I'm just gonna fuck off. <laughs> right, all right, yeah. Sorry for the wild tangent, guys, <laughs> on uh, animals and death. Uh, anyways, going back, uh, do you want to do Latin or you want me to do something on the Eastern Europe? Okay, right, you go ahead and it will take. Okay. It. So, I did a little bit of research on Europe. Uh, I didn't get that far. Uh, maybe because of my laziness or maybe because I, I don't know. I couldn't find much. But what I found is a lot of Eastern European side, most of them were um, Orthodox, whatever, like um, Orthodox Christian, I think, or something like that. So, they have three special numbers. The third day after you die is when the soul leaves the body. The ninth day after you die is when the spirit leaves the body. 
and then the fortieth day is when the body ceases to exist. Ooh. So that's kind of how they do it. Days. So so they never they never mourn past forty days. Mm-hmm. Kind of like how in the Chinese or Buddhism one, we don't mourn past forty nine days. Mm-hmm. Like they're not the same, but like same range, I guess. Uh, for them, <clears throat> they only accept bur- burial, so they don't accept cre- cremation or anything like that. Uh, typically, they would clean the body in warm water first. So this is like something about purity, like cleansing them of, you know, all the hoeing they did throughout their lives <laughs> or something. <laughs> I don't know, right? Uh, then they dress them in all white. Again, something related to the purity. And then they're laid in an open casket. I think the open casket stops after the... Th- I won't say either the third or the ninth day. I, I forgot what it was. Um, but typically, when they go anywhere, they always travel feet first. And this is something to make sure that the, the spirit doesn't go back to the home or anything. Like, pretty much to make sure the spirit doesn't settle. It goes with the body to wherever they're going. Uh, so then, that was the cool one. Or that was the general one. It felt like most of Eastern Europe all use this. Then I looked up, because I thought it would be really cool, the Norse one. Like, the Vikings. Because oh. you guys ever watch, like, Game of Thrones or anything with, like, some type of Viking shit? Where it's like the super honorable takeoff is like they put you on a they put the dead body on a bow and they shoot a fire arrow to the yeah, bow and just burns like, it down. Yeah. yeah, so that that doesn't happen. Oh, oh really? Lie. So typically, if that's a complete lie, uh, not complete. So here's the nuances. So typically, they're very into their boats. Like they love boats. Like they're fucking the sailing club. They love boats. Okay. Um, yacht club. Yeah, the yacht club. Uh, Fifty BC. <laughs> <laughs> if. So if you're just a you know peasant Viking or Norseman or whatever, you'll be buried with other Norsemen, but shaped in a bowl. So like how they bury you would be like shaped like a bowl, right? So they'll they'll put you guys together so it's all shaped as one big bowl. If you're a high ranking Norseman, they bury you with your bowl. So they take oh. your bowl and your body and they bury it all together. Damn, and apparently you got a big ass wow. bowl, oh, yeah. big ass hole. Yeah. 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 But apparently it's rare because it's like it has to be very high ranking because they value their bolts so much and they put so much time and effort to making their bolts because oh. they're always in like sea combat, mm. right? Uh, so that's very rare. And then, um, yeah, so like the burning thing doesn't really happen that much or ever, really. Um, there's some like weird woo-woo voodoo shit that goes on with something with like burning and, and like a sex slave. And so I, I didn't go further than that because I was like, this is kind of weird now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was with the Norsemen, but typically they just get buried with the boat or in the shape of the boat. It's just something with boats that they really like about. Yeah. Mm. That's how they do it. That was the Norse one I researched up. Then I was in charge of doing Africa, and I felt like they didn't really have much difference. Um, African burials and most European or just standard burials. Just what you'd expect out of a... Okay, so you, know. you guys know what the coffin dance is? That was what I was expecting to get a lot of information on. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is just a meme, so then it wasn't. So <laughs> I, I'm, oh, I'm yes. going to briefly play the coffin dance so uh, Viv and Will can kind of know. And you guys can probably hear the music in this. <laughs> what? I've definitely seen the meme. <laughs> Wait, have you ever seen this meme? Yeah, you've never seen it? I know what you're talking yeah. about. Right? It looks so cool. Okay, so I went into to research Africa <laughs> specifically because of this video. I was like, do they really do this typically? The song, though. Yeah. Yeah, that was the, that, that's the meme part is putting the song to this. But the dancing part looks, I don't know, pretty unique. So guys, if you're wondering, we're just playing uh, Coffin Dance on YouTube. And it's just the meme. Coffee yeah. Nance official music video. It, there's 375 million views. It's gonna be the first one you're gonna see, guys. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty much like six guys dressed very, very oh, nicely. Of wow. So oh, uh, I'll, I'll stop the music so so we can kind of talk. But they pretty much they put the music in sync with the dancing, which makes it a meme. Uh, but they're dressed very, very nicely, very nicely, and they're they have a they have a swaggy ass dance. Like this is some. Yeah, they're really balancing that well on their shoulders. Yeah, yeah, and and they they have a whole band behind them. But I think when I searched up more about the pallbearers, these are called the pallbearers. Um, they wanted it to be more of a celebration of life than a mourning of death. So then, therefore, they they advertise this as a thing they can do for when someone dies. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's, I guess it must have caught on popularity because it seems like I don't know. I think it's cool, and like later on we'll get more into this, but. I personally think that it's 
nice if more people did this where it's more of a celebration of life rather yeah. than the morning of death right i was just thinking if i saw like <laughs> what like you know someone here or something yeah. <laughs> no, 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 so. no. this is like what if this was the burial for like somebody that means a lot to me so like one of my parents i think if i saw this i'd be like what the fuck is going on <laughs> dad are you okay <laughs> Do you like this? <laughs> so yeah, we just we just passed a scene at like two minutes where they were like doing deadlifts with a coffin. It's hilarious. Can I sign up? Uh, but yeah, anyways, uh, we'll talk more about the feelings later. I guess after we go through some of this cultural stuff, because I have a like my thought. It's not like I'm like a professional. Like I don't even want to say grieving right now. Like a professional person who like is involved with death a lot in my life. But I always thought that it'd be so cool to make it more of a celebration. Like, the tragedy has already happened. At the moment of the funeral, like, nothing is reversible, right? That like, you can't true. do anything. So, why not celebrate the accomplishments rather than, you know, cry a lot, right? This is my thought process, but I, I at the same time, my understand. My biggest guess is that you're still sad <laughs> that your fucking family member has died. And you can't be like, all right, so tomorrow I have to be really happy. <laughs> Let's celebrate their life. Yes. But I don't know. I think, I don't know. Maybe I just have too naive or positive, naive and positive mindset towards it, which makes it, makes me think that way, I guess. But anyways, let's move on to uh, Latin America. All right. So in Latin America, there's a day called Dia de... De los Mortos. <laughs> Sorry for the butchering that name, but it's the Day of the Dead. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it. If you've watched Coco, that's actually something that happens in that movie. It's a very good movie. Kind of sad, but very good. And on the Day of the Dead, they celebrate their loved ones, the people who have died. They A lot of people dress up or do makeup, and they paint their faces like skulls that have that are adorned with flowers or petals around their eyes and sometimes or traditionally they'll have the name of the dead person on their forehead or somewhere decorated along the skull. It's very colorful, it looks very I guess pretty in a way but the reason for this is that it's supposed to be, it's called sugar skulls by the way. The made of sugar? Or it's just... called a sugar skull. Oh. They would decorate a skull Usually it'll have the name of the dead person on it, and it's supposed to be placed on the altar, and it's for the departed loved one to be remembered by. And you're supposed to put all the colors that represents the dead person, and make sure it's kind of like an art piece for the dead person uh, who's passed away. Wait, so quick thing. You guys all watch Coco? Mm -hmm. You watch Coco? Yes. Alright, again, spoiler. You just don't fucking listen to this if you're scared of spoilers. <laughs> We're gonna spoil everything. <laughs> Okay, I thought it was so sad when I found out the the dog was oh. not mm. in life. Right? I was like, yeah. oh no, baby Taro. No. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I was like, when I found that out, that was crazy. But Taro's was his dog, by the way. Yeah, not the crying not the, not the, <laughs> 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 root vegetable. Uh, but I thought it was kind of cool because I always thought. I don't know if you ever watched... Is this called The Lonely Bones or The Lovely Bones? Oh, The Lovely mm. Bones. Is it Lovely or Lonely Bones? Lovely Bones. And, oh, that's so sad. Okay, so Lovely Bones is about um, this rapey guy and the girl and yeah. she died and stuff like that. Okay. But you, you know how... Again, spoiler. In, in the movie, <laughs> she, she died, but in her mind, she was still alive. Mm -hmm. I always thought that. What if that was... Like a thing, like you know how there's like a million or like infinite different universes, and you ever go through like a weird like almost death experience or like oh shit that car could have hit me or something like that. Oh, but you yeah. actually just switched into another dimension. Or like yeah, that you yeah. didn't actually. Yeah. Get or or what if hit. like like you think that you're still alive, but. Like, in reality, in reality oh, but then, but then, in that dimension, you went to another dimension no, no. where that car crash didn't actually or, happen. Or, or he, here's even the crazy part: so you go through a near near death experience, and you, and it doesn't happen. You're like, oh shit, what a what a relief that accident hit my head or or some bullshit like that, right? And then, thirty years later, you get like a stroke, and then you wake up. You're actually waking up a coma from the accident that actually did happen. But in your mind, you're having a dream for like a 30-year dream. But you know how time is different in a dream than every It's the last life? Wednesday theory again. Is that is that the movie? Is, is there a movie like this? Or? Oh, no. There's a theory called The Last Wednesday something. 
last Wednesday theory where you can't prove everything that's happened or all of history wasn't just written last Wednesday and just put into your oh. brain. It's kind of like the same. But yeah, like you kind of get the, I don't know, mm. I was like, fuck man, I should just, I should make a movie. <laughs> Wouldn't that be such a, I don't know, that'd be such a mindfuck concept, hey? Yeah, right? Like, you keep thinking, oh, this is the real plot of the movie. Oh my god, he woke up yeah. again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's like that Rick and Morty episode where, uh, <laughs> the one we talked about before, yeah. where, where Morty ended up, spoiler again, where, where Morty ended up just being a carpet salesman. Pretty much, it was a game. It was an arcade game where you, like, go into this reality, but you actually, like, live a life, and then they see who gets the most points. And Morty got like pretty shit points because he like <laughs> fell in love and had a carpet store and lived to old and then died. <laughs> but yeah, that, that's what I was always mind fucked about. I was like, what if you have like a near death experience? Like, like you get in a car accident and you actually live, but like in real, not reality, but like alternate dimension, or maybe in reality you actually didn't and you're in a dream right now or something like that. Maybe we actually never really die. Ooh, like the simulation. I like but every single time we think thing. someone dies, they're actually just moving on to another dimension, and we happen to uh, catch them. Mm. Well, we'll talk about that during our theories after uh, this whole cultural thing. Yeah, but anyways, yeah. the Day of the Dead is on November 2nd, so happened just recently. I don't know if any of you guys have been to it. A lot of people in Hispanic and Latin culture use a lot, a lot, a lot of candles during their ceremonies. They're usually those tall candles that you would see Jesus Christ's picture on it. I wonder if there's a or relation of, like, that day and, like, firefighter responses or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> With all the candles they use. <laughs> like, so know, like, probably yeah. some statistics. Well, like, isn't there a thing about uh, Christmas trees and fires? Like, oh, it's yeah, common. Yeah. For, yeah, so I wonder if, like, using up. all those candles and... Probably. But they use a lot of candles. Right, right. Like, adorn the whole altar with the candles. Usually it's a three to four day thing. There's vigils to honor the dead ones and they use a lot of photos as you, if anyone have watched Coco's, they use a lot of photos of all the past deceased family members. There is a rosary event that happens where they pray for a certain amount of days with the rosary. And as you also have seen in Coco and in also Chinese culture and a lot of Asian cultures, they use the yellow flowers. And typically this yellow flower is a marigold and they'll... In Latin America or, or Hispanic culture, they'll sprinkle it all over the place because it's supposed because the orange color, the bright orange color, and the aroma is supposed to lure heavenly souls to earth or guide the souls to the altar. So they'll sometimes sprinkle the petals from the body or from the opening of the opening of the house, the door of the house to the altar, and it's supposed to guide whatever souls come into the house, which should be your deceased one. All the way to the altar so they could go to heaven or go wherever you want them to go. I thought that's so nice. Like, yeah. the whole the Coco flowers? thing, it made... I don't know, like... If I was a Mexican kid, and I was very confused about death, and I watched Coco, I'd feel a lot better. Oh, yeah. Because it makes it's it look so beautiful. Really right? pretty. Like, it just makes it look like... Uh, like a celebration mm. of life and all that stuff what I was talking about before. All the flowers everywhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It just makes... It, it looks so cool. But okay, weird thing I thought about when I saw these... And I probably won't get anyone relating to me. But I used to play a Steam game called Guacamelee. <laughs> where it's these wrestlers. <laughs> where it's these wrestlers wearing, Wearing's like, mask. these masks and stuff. And I kept seeing those skulls everywhere. Like, the skull was actually something you had to collect in the game. Uh, yeah, I don't know why. It just re- reminded me of Gu- Maybe slightly racist, but it reminds me of the game Guacamelee. And it was, it was a really fun game. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's cool. I The colors are so nice. Like... The, the the colored skulls they have? Yeah, I think it's definitely one of the prettiest funeral or death celebrations. It's it's so colorful, so it's think. not just black and white. And, like, these look like Ed Hardy? Does it kind of look like Ed Hardy design? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like, okay, let me see. Let's, let's see if I'm talking about the right brand here. Okay, maybe not so much. I thought there was an Ed Hardy design with the skull with like a really pretty color. Like this one is kind of what it reminds me of. And it sees luck. Okay, well, maybe not exactly. Mm. <laughs> Live, li- life, love, luck, kills. Okay. All right. Sure. Oh, this one right here. Like this kind of remind me yeah, of it. Like yeah. a really oh, yeah. flowery, colorful thing with uh, with a skull is what Classic I kind of see from this. American tattoo style. Yes. Well, there ain't no trap stamp, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so the... This day is to celebrate, like, a day of the death, right? Mm-hmm. So, for their culture, for funerals, is it similar? Like, do they just do a smaller 
ceremony similar to this? Or? So the Day of the Dead is actually like a whole festival. Right. But on their little ceremonies, they'll have... It's more like an actual funeral where they'll have like a wake. They'll have the altar and everything. But they'll still have people... Sometimes people will paint their faces. But usually the skulls that they paint on their face for the Day of the Dead, it's usually on an actual skull or a sugar skull or something fake mm -hmm. that they'll put on the altar. So not it's an that, actual skull. Not an actual... Where do well, they find some, that? some of the things that I read, sometimes they'll use an actual skull. Of who? If it's like a the... rival uh, <laughs> cartel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when you say Day of the Dead, it actually reminds me of the Chinese one. It's called, uh, how do you say this in Chinese? Qingming. Oh, yeah. Qingming. Qingming. Yeah, Qingming. Qingming is, is oh. We have, like, I remember always going to the graveyard uh, where some of my relatives are buried and then also where they're cremated and we put the jar of the ashes there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we'd burn a bunch of stuff. Because I always remember it was cold. So I think this year it's on April 5th. Mm -hmm. But I, I remember there's always still snow on the ground. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Because I remember I never caught the ground on fire, which is, which is good. <laughs> um, and then I remember burning a bunch of stuff usually and then bringing a bunch of food and praying and all that stuff. I, I really like playing with fire, so that was always my favorite part. You just creating, burning the you know? offerings. You're yeah, just constantly just tossing, tossing the things. stuff in the fire pit. <laughs> What's better than arsonist. like you're helping out, but you're just yeah. having fun burning things? <laughs> What's better than uh, burning fake money? <laughs> Real money! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay, so cool. There's... I wonder... Maybe we didn't do our research good enough. I wonder if other cultures have a Day of the Dead, too. Because clearly the Latin one does. On the spot. Uh, Day of the Dead. It's gonna be a fucking movie. Oh, never mind. Day of the <laughs> Dead. Um, other cultures? Latin America from Brazil to Philippines. Oh, so the Philippines might celebrate Day of the Dead, but similar to the Latin one. I guess they have a uh, Latin inspiration. Oh, that's true, they do. Mm, oh, Asia and Oceania. Oh, Mexican Day of the Dead occur in major cities. And Okay, that's normal. I wonder if Day of the Dead is, like, trademarked by the Mexicans or something. You know what I mean? Like, if you call it the Day of the Dead... Then it's the Mexican thing. So you just have Day of the Dead everywhere else, but it's still like a Latino thing. Whereas like Tsingming is a Chinese, Chinese. thing, mm -hmm. right? So you have to use a different wording or something. Maybe it's because the Day of the Dead is literally like perfect translation to Dia de los Muertos. Mm -hmm. They could have took that name, motherfuckers. <laughs> 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 All right, uh, what else you got? That was that. That's everything on Latin and Hispanic. Mm, cool, cool, cool. Okay, let's. Um, we're already like an hour and a bit in, so that's pretty cool. Let's talk a bit more about your uh, personal experiences. Personal experiences. Yeah, yeah. So I think I've said this in the past podcasts before. I had several. So uh, my aunt, my uncle, and my grandpa. And then I have two grandparents in Vietnam, but I've never attended anything really. Mm -hmm. Uh but then I think I said this before, the the one that impacted me the most was my friend who died that was like similar age to me <clears throat> from a car accident. But that was because it was tragic. I feel like when my grandpa passed away, it was kind of like, he was already really old. There's already a lot of things going on. It's kind of like... It's... It wasn't sudden, right? Yeah. Like, it was yeah. like you were yeah. anticipating it for a while. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Like my heart breaks for anyone who like got murdered or anything like that because that's like super mm -hmm. sudden and preventable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Whereas... Like an accident's an accident, right? You can't really say it's preventable because that's that's life, right? If you get the, the shit end of the stick, it is what it is, right? Mm -hmm. But then for my grandpa, it wasn't... I was like... I feel like you have a different kind of sadness. Like if it's a tragic death compared to a natural death, I want to say. Like a, I get it. Like a natural death, it feels like, yeah, like... He so, was suffering already near the end is like, this is the progression of life. This is what had to happen, mm -hmm. right? Whereas if it was tragic, it'd be like, it hits you all at once, right? It's like, you know, this person, this, this Mr. Smith was next to me the other day and all of a sudden he's gone and he was a perfectly healthy person. Shit, that could have been me. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So those were kind of the two. I guess first I'll talk about the natural one. So when it happened to the natural one, when my grandpa passed away, uh, it was like, I felt like it was like five years coming. Like in the last five years, there's so way too many issues. Like you, we knew like something is going to happen right yeah. like you can only live through so many things right 
and life just catches up with you. Um, but I remember it was kind of a big deal because our family is a very uh, like a patriarch family. So like the, my grandpa was like the yeah, head the of top, the family, yeah. right? Yeah. So that like we had a bunch of people there, and uh, I remember it was all like pretty kosher. Like yeah, we were sad, but it wasn't crazy. But the saddest part was uh, when we cremated him. So when we cremated him, me and all my cousins and aunts and everyone were in the room. Oh. And my uncle had to press the button. Oh, no. And when that happened, like, it wasn't necessarily that happening. But it was the fact that I saw so many of my family members so sad at once that, like, broke my heart. Oh, my goodness. Just like, oh, my goodness. This yeah. is so much, right? But throughout everything else, it felt like, yeah, it wasn't a tragedy. It was more of, like, this is what's going to happen. It's You can't get too sad over it because it's, like, progression of life, mm-hmm. right? Like, he's lived, I like, think he was, like, 80-some. Yeah. yeah, he was... It was quite old. Mm-hmm. So, but like that instantaneous moment was like a pretty heartbreaking moment. But it was just, yeah. It was just like a lot of things happening, right? Like, like everyone's just crying there. And then as soon as you press a button, you hear a lot of things happening. And oh, it's just like, yeah. I completely understand what you mean. Yeah. How about you? How, like, any, let's, let's talk about more of like natural deaths first. Like, any, anyone. Um, the one, I've been to two funerals in my life, but one of them didn't really mean that much to me because I think I was really young and I didn't really know the person that well. It was mm-hmm. my grandmother's mom, so my great-grandmother, but I didn't really know her that well and I was very too, a little bit too young to really understand. Wait, how how old were you? I think I was maybe like five or six. Oh. So That's it, crazy that your great-grandmother yeah, your was still... Still, yeah. Like, yeah. That's four generations That's that was crazy. at one point probably all like, yeah. alive. Wow. That's... I didn't even yeah. I didn't even really know what was happening when I was at the funeral. I remember thinking was, Oh, this is a funeral. I didn't feel any sadness at all. I was just like, Oh, so this is what we're doing today, okay, type of thing. But when my grandmother on my dad's side of the family passed away, she passed away when I was I think around fifteen, sixteen. So that one hit a little hard because even though she used to live in Vancouver, she would come over every year to visit us. And she would stay for months at a time. And every single morning, her and I would go on a walk to Tim Hortons because she loved Tim Hortons. And we'd get ice caps together because we both freaking love coffee. But what was sad was when she passed away, she was in Nanaimo. And it was really sudden. I believe it was on a weekend or something. We got a phone call and my aunt called my dad and said that my grandma was in the hospital and she wasn't doing well and she probably wasn't going to make it. So me and my dad booked a plane ticket that morning to leave like a few hours later just to go straight to Nanaimo and it was so busy at the hospital. Oh, I also remember that was the first day I ever saw my dad cry in my entire life. Jeez. Absolutely first day I saw my dad cry. Is that terrifying? I think I only see my dad cry like maybe once. Right? It's like a side that you never think you would see. But when you see it, I'm, it's absolutely heartbreaking. Because you I'm, know it's not normal for them. I'm not ready to be a father. <laughs> <laughs> I cry all the time. <laughs> I'm not ready whatsoever. Yeah. Um, when we were there, the hospital was really busy. Even though the, not, the Nanaimo hospital isn't that big. And all my aunts and uncles and my dad and all my older cousins, they were rushing in and out of the room. And something that hurt me for a really long time was that because the room was so busy and there was a lot of doctors and everyone running around I I was never able to go in and actually say Uh goodbye even though I was at the hospital before she passed away but regardless I thought I wouldn't be that sad because I was like oh I haven't seen my grandma in like a year it's not like too bad right like I wouldn't be that sad so during the wake I didn't cry I mostly just felt bad that my cousins and everyone was crying and I knew it was really sad but that moment that you were just talking about oh. at the during the cremation when someone I don't remember who pressed the button but yeah. I think it was somebody that worked at the funeral home they press the button you hear the machine turn on yeah. you hear all the oh. the fire roar and then all at once I could hear all my aunts and uncles and everyone just wail and start crying yeah. and they start like bawling out and all their audible cries that just broke my heart Oh yeah. And that's when I started so crying. Cuz that so was tough. perfectly fine until that moment when you hear everyone just break down crying at the same time. Oh. Yeah. Well, Sad okay, so I was lucky, not I want to say lucky, but like different scenario for me cuz when my grandpa and my aunt died, they were both in palliative care. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. So that moment, there was like a week period where we knew like this may or may not be the last day for a whole week. So every day we were there like mm-hmm. seeing them, right? Yeah. So we all had a chance to like see them. But I thought the saddest part, and I don't think it really happened with my grandpa, but whenever you see someone go through like dementia, it's almost like oh. by the time they're dead, they weren't even around for the last like year or two, it felt mm-hmm. like. Well, like, you know what I mean? True. Like they weren't like sensibly there anymore, mm-hmm. right? It's kind of like, oh, like at that point, I felt like I would be more sad at the point when they're starting to get it than when they actually pass away. Because it's oh, like, how much of them are actually here now? Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Which is why sleep, <laughs> getting enough sleep will prevent you from getting, um, yeah, like uh, the whole gray matter. I, I, I spoke about this uh, for, for Will's knowledge. I spoke about this in a, another podcast, the very first one we did about mm-hmm. sleep. How uh, like deep rest actually washes out the, the, the plaque in your brain when you actually get deep sleep and that oh. same plaque is what causes uh what's that word not dementia but the other one just a well rested night yeah well like getting how many into, hours getting into a state of deep sleep oh like okay. deep sleep is yeah. a state uh no REM sleep is the dreaming state okay. deep sleep is when your brain's like all in sync uh what's the other word for dementia <laughs> all alzheimer's yes yes that was one of the key things they were trying to test for with deep sleep but yeah like outside of that i i always get sad when i see that because like, I think, Will, you're probably familiar with hospitals, but for me, like, I've only worked at a, at a senior homes, but mm-hmm. you see that a lot more in senior homes. Mm-hmm. It's kind of sad because you're like, like, who is it there? You know what I mean? It's yeah. not who's presently here. It's maybe someone a lot younger or someone different, but it's not who's physically there right yeah. now. That right? just reminded me of something that happened. So I was <clears> thinking about what a, what other time that I related to death, and it's when my dad passed away for a bit, for a bit. So this I mentioned this story. in in a last podcast, but what basically happened to my dad was he had an allergy reaction one night and he had troubles breathing. So my mom brought him to the doc or to the emergency room, and the nurse there happened to give him the wrong dose of the wrong medicine and in the wrong place, and it went straight to his heart and gave him cardiac arrest. And he ended up oh, shit. he was pronounced dead for I think it was four minutes or something longer than that. And during that time, I got that phone call. Where my mom was bawling out crying. She was like, the doctor just said your dad is officially dead. And he, getting that phone call, oh my goodness, I can't forget. Can't even about, yeah, I can't the forget way the way the my way. mom said it. Her voice was cracking. You can hear the beeping in the background. You can hear like shouting and like busyness in the background of the hospital. Oh my God, it was so sad. But from what you were just saying just now about dementia, after my dad, eventually he was able to get... Uh, he came back to life. Defib- defibrillated mm-hmm. back to life. Did you did you ever ask him what he saw in that moment? Yeah. What do you say? <laughs> I think it's because he's religious. That's what um, I'm putting him on. Saw Jesus? But he said- <laughs> Wait, so just to be clear, he's well and fine. Yeah, today he's today, okay. overall okay. Okay. But he said it was like dark and he heard a voice calling to him. Uh-huh. But the voice was my mom saying like my mom in like real life calling yeah. to him and saying like don't die mm. but he said he kept hearing my mom's voice but it felt really far away mm-hmm. and there are these people dressed in all black mm-hmm. just dragging him to like a darker place whoa hey. yeah that's what he said so he what, said the what got boy, him out of it he said he oh. was following my mom's voice oh, literally wow so I, I, I don't know maybe that's religion maybe that's real that's crazy but like regardless it's what he saw right yeah. so that's kind of cool Kind of cool, right? But regardless, when you were mentioning the dimension thing, yeah. after my dad came out of the hospital, I felt that. I felt like, oh, like, who are you now? Are you really the uh, same person? Because my dad had a lot of side effects. Mm. He couldn't sleep without a breathing machine for mm. the longest time because his lungs were shut down when he goes unconscious, basically when he's in deep sleep. And he had, he was on a lot of pills. So it affected his mood and affected his energy level so he was sleeping most of the time for the two years after the hospital he slept so freaking much Mm -hmm. he would sleep a lot and when he was awake he wouldn't remember things yeah his personality felt like it was different yeah like he was lethargic all the time or he would get really angry or he just wouldn't care about things or he just wouldn't be able to be happy or he would forget about things so it really felt like that dementia thing like who are you like what is this right right I had a lot of, like, I like to write things down and, like, write notes for people a lot. I had a lot of notes that I would, like, write to him and, like, slip under his door because I would be like, oh, you don't remember that this happened today? Or, like, oh, today this is how your day went and I would slip under his door. 
and let him know like oh this is how your day went in case you forget tomorrow or in case you have a bad day next week and you don't remember that you had a good day last week or yeah. something like that it felt like dementia honestly i'm i'm really curious like in his memory was that all just a fog like those couple of weeks or months or whatever i think it was because this we had this one incident where i was getting upset with him because he seemed like he was getting decently good and like better enough his health yeah and I wrote, I wrote another note to him. I was like, I know you went through a lot, but now it's about time that you start picking your life back up, essentially. Like, you mm. can only be in the state for so long if you want to get your life back to normal. And he said that that note kind of woke him up because he felt like he wasn't the same person he was for the last two years. And that he felt like he was so lazy and so tired all the time in a way that he just can't help it. And that he had no motivation. He had troubles with his memory. He always just felt gross on the inside, like sick. Mm. So possibly. Okay, oh. so before Will starts, crazy thing. So I read about, it was the same thing I told you guys last time, John Nash. Mm -hmm. He's like a famous mathematician, but he also has schizophrenia. And I was reading his like bibliography or something. It was written, not his autobiography, it's his biography. So it was written by someone else. And it was like, when he was schizophrenic, he felt like he had a very clear state of mind. But when he was doing treatment, it just felt like mind fog. And I wonder, like, is that just mm. how it is for schizophrenics, right? Because their brains are so much different than ours, right? Have you watched Arcane? No, that, that LOL, the LOL... Yeah, the uh, LOL show, have you watched Arcane? No. Seems like trash because Dota 2 is the only good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I started watching it again, and there's a character on there. Her name is Jinx. Jinx. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think she has schedule. She has giant lips or something? It's oh, with the blue hair, right? Yeah, she oh. has blue hair. Not blonde, not the Nicki Minaj Pokemon? <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But I think she has schedule because of the last episode that I saw. She kept talking to herself. And, and you're was... spoiling it for everyone. This isn't a spoiler. This is just. This is even Personality. <laughs> all right, all right. All right. How, about, how about natural death in your life? Uh, I, I guess your your side of the family. Yeah, yeah. Been to a lot of the funerals yeah. for your side of the family. For my side of the family, I've been to my grandma and grandpa's side. Yeah. Um, other than that, really nothing much. But listening to your your guys' perspective for families, I think my family's pretty fucked up. Like, like there was crying, but it, there wasn't hysterical like wailing oh. or crying like everyone was very stoic oh. like yeah and then made me feel weird crying as well oh, really yeah, yeah. it's like everyone was very stoic and just yeah. like i don't know wait so has your perception of death changed being a nurse like you you guys like as nurses you guys probably face this way more than the most people the fucked up part is that you never get trained on it like they don't even teach you yeah. other than beyond how someone dies and what happens afterwards yeah. they never prepare you for like what to do with either the family or even what the patients when they're imminently dying like what to say to them and so like that so really everything is just through experience so when i was still a nursing student when i had my first patient that died oh no it was like actually a summer gig so like i was in this like nurse next door job yeah. and the whole job was just for companion and i was paired up with another nurse um, and we basically just administered painkillers for this individual for the longest yeah. for throughout the night, and then he passed during our during our shift. So at that point, I actually didn't feel not that I didn't feel sad, but it was just almost like I couldn't express any of the sadness while I was working. Yeah. So everything was bottled up the entire night. Like we we had to work with um, the morgue, so we had to call. Uh, the family, the, the the one of the daughter was here. We had to call the rest of the family in. Um, we had to do the post mortem care, so the yeah. cleaning and, and dressing, and then eventually the next shift came on, and we called the funeral home, and they came in essentially, um, assessed the body and, and took it with them. So during that whole shift, I went home. I remember it was a night shift, so yeah. it was like a, I think it was like a seven p.m. to seven a.m. shift. Yeah. And it happened like probably at around twelve o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Um. As soon as that happened, me and my, the, the, the buddy nurse that I was with was actually my friend. And we both just like, we never call each other ever. Like we, I really only have text messages with him. And he called me 
to like kind of like debrief of what happened yeah and like i just realized i was like it still didn't dawn on me at that point as to what happened like this was my first death like first time dealing with the body first time caring for someone first time like talking to a family member that's mourning it's it's like you had to be a robot at exactly time. at yeah. that time like almost like i have to just recall everything that i've learned and just essentially recite and do the same thing for the for the for the family yeah like didn't show any type of like empathy yes but no sad emotions like not able to break down not able to cry and thereafter i like it just felt terrible like it felt super ill i felt super ill and my friends my friend didn't feel good either so then we had uh probably a week afterwards we went counseling for this exact moment because both of us were he was a brand new nurse and i was still a student nurse at that time and we like talked through all these things like i guess one of the key things that stuck with me was like anything that happens in that role when you're a nurse it almost has to stay like like professional right like you can't take anything home with you mm -hmm. and that's the thing that made me feel the worst is that i don't like i take all those things with me and yeah. that's probably one of the bad things about this profession is that you can never really be fully desensitized like those individuals that like you have people that say like oh yeah i'm desensitized to that like i don't really it doesn't bother me anymore almost feels like they don't they're at a point where they don't really care at that yeah. point like it's just a part of their job right well, like this happens and it, it's crazy because it feels like this is one of the most human job and you have to take that part of it out of it mm -hmm. like exactly. this is literally the like one, of, one of the jobs where you have the most human interaction and you have to take the humanity out of it yeah. to actually go through it. Yeah. And, like, I guess a part of me, like, felt that way. Like, felt that... They felt worse because throughout childhood, like, I, I, I grew up in a nuclear family. So, mom, dad, and me. I was an only child. So, the when I was young, when I was in, like, the yeah. elementary nuclear family. So, like, like, it's usually as many sons as you want and then one mom and one dad like a complete family yeah like no separations so a nuclear family so when i was super young i guess the death to me at that point was really more about like holy shit like when when i realized when my um grandpa passed away he was i was pretty young i was probably in like grade five um my that's really when it dawned on me that holy shit like if my parents were to pass away today like, this irrational fear of mine is that who the hell is going to take care of me? Like, yeah. it was more, like, selfish, right? Like, <laughs> holy <laughs> shit. Yeah. <laughs> like, what the hell? Like, they if they leave, what am I supposed to do? Like, that that was my irrational fear. I really didn't think about anything else beyond myself. And then when I was in my teen years, um, I started to be more empathetic and felt that, like, dying in general is just something that's so hard for family members and then when i grow up when i'm like in my mid 30s or like early 30s right now my worries like my views of death the concept of it when i was a teen was like the bigger risk that i take so for example like taking a jump on a hill on a, on a snowboard and surviving that was like yes like it was rewarding for me yeah like death was like the you only live once was very like ingrained when i was in my teen years yeah and then when i'm older now when i'm in my 30s the worries that I have is not like dying itself. Like I could die today. It doesn't matter to me, but everyone else that I leave behind, like, what are they going to do? Like my wife, my family, my extended family, like that's my biggest worry. So like right. the death, like kind of like evolved as I grew older and had more experience. Yeah. But then as a nurse, like you almost can't bring that into your, your professional life. So the things that you say to, you, to the families is like, you know, like, you did the best that you can. The it's patient like, is as comfortable as they co are. Copy paste. Off, exactly. Like, yeah. It's like it's yeah. so. Yeah. There's no it's feeling so weird. To it. Yeah. It's so robot. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that's like the hardest feeling. So that's why I stopped doing bedside nursing, because like some of the worst deaths that I've seen, like before I went into this role in infection control, I was a bed bedside nurse in recovery room, and like a lot of the deaths that I see are never, like prolonged. Right. It's not like. Uh, Jorge's sister worked in medicine for the longest time. They see patients for like weeks and months and still like in a dying state. But minds are usually all trauma related. So uh, someone comes uh. in, they die, 
and they're intraoperative, so they do the best that they can, closing them up and cleaning them. And then the family gets to see them in our area before the patient goes to the It's like a fast turnover. It's faster, like like super fast turnover. And it's like the worst feeling because obviously like um, not a lot of patients die from like elective surgeries, like a hip replacement and shit like that, right? Like more of them is like trauma related, disease, cancer and stuff like that. So having the family there, seeing the patient in that state when they're not like presentable in a sense where like their their body's still cut open mm-hmm. and like they're sewn back together stapled together but not done perfectly it just doesn't seem like them and it's just that feeling just goes home with you a lot of the times so oh, the, it's so hard does it does it get easier or not really i guess it depends on some people like some people yeah. they literally is copy and paste like i have coworkers that it doesn't even phase them yeah. if someone dies. Like, they're just doing it, and then right after that, they're, like, on their phone looking up Kijiji deals. Like, it just doesn't, like... Like, I, I wonder, like, t- t- like sometimes I wonder if they break down when they're at home, like, right. taking a shower, or, like, when they're actually thinking about something, or if they, like, just have some type of mechanism that they can just block off and not care about it. And I just need to learn how to do that, but in this job, it's kind of... It's tough. Yeah. Here's a crazy thing I actually just thought of, uh, not completely related, but like, when you think of one death, like someone close to you, or just any one death, you really feel for it. It's like, oh my god, like someone died. They could have been like that's someone's brother, that's someone's dad, that's someone's grandpa. But when you when you think of like a hundred deaths, ten thousand deaths, or something like that, you can't even quantify that anymore. Like the feelings are almost taken out of it when you get to some crazy number. It becomes a stat. It literally becomes a stat at that point, Mm -hmm. which makes it so sad. But when you just think of the one person, like you feel for it. But I was just thinking, like as a nurse, like if you go through so many, does it forcefully make it you think of a big number rather than one now? Because one death to a lot of people feels like very impactful, very big. But when you say a hundred or something like that, now you're going to like something hysterical that your brain can't even wrap around. So then it just doesn't, it doesn't create a human relation with that anymore. Yeah. It's just mm-hmm. like a stat number. Like yeah. if, if I said like this is eighty two percent effective, like it doesn't truly mean anything to a lot of people. It's just a number to them, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I feel like if that's the case in that type of profession, right, when they experience this all the time, yeah. right? I guess like for for you guys, when you hear someone's death, you don't necessarily know their backstory, right? Yeah. But as a nurse. Like, the most memorable one for me has, like, a huge amount of backstory. And that's probably my fault because I read up on the patient before because I was anticipating this patient to be mine yeah. post-operatively after the operation. So this patient, male, probably, like, mid-40s, was at home eating dinner with their kids. Wife as well. Recently unemployed. The mom doesn't work. They have two younger children. He collapsed while eating dinner not entirely sure why he's a bigger burlier guy so he has a really big belly yeah they bring him in he goes to the or and um they needed help because they need to run the mass transfusion so this person was losing a lot of blood yeah. barely had a like barely had a blood pressure so i remember in there just looking up the IV bag or the the blood bags doing the checks I'm, I'm not obviously scrubbed in doing the actual surgery, so we're just circulating and helping around, yeah. like administering blood, and etc. cetera. Um, and I remember the surgeon. The surgeon is like a very tiny, like five foot three Asian lady, uh, young. And she's like, okay, we're, we're, we're going to go in, find the bleed in the abdomen. Uh, they did ultrasounds before and, and CT scans to see where the ble- bleed was, and they determined it was within the abdomen. They just don't know exactly where. And I very distinctly remember the the surgeon telling me to attach the uh, cautery pad. So there's a device that kind of essentially burns tissue and it cuts things and it also stops bleeding by burning it. So in order for that to work, a sticky pad needs to be put on the flesh of the patient and then the pad would work because it's, it's like a safety measure. Yeah. It's like almost like a ground. Yeah. So as I was reaching in to to put it in, the first cut that they usually do is they use a scalpel for a clean cut, right? Thereafter, inside, when they're when they're cutting through fat and muscle and tissue, they, they are using uh, the, ca- <laughs> the cautery. <laughs> Not quite. And I just remember, as I was placing the pad, she cut the abdomen, and I hear, like, a huge pop. Like, the like a, like a balloon just popping, and then a 
like a fountain of blood essentially flowing over the abdomen oh. onto the floor. So we like grabbed all the all, all the the blankets and just shoving like shoving under the the surgeons because it was essentially pooling and like kind of draining out of the yeah. the OR. So I remember doing that, and then about two minutes later, we're still trying to transfuse. Um, two to three minutes later, the surgeon's like still trying to find the um, the bleed. Yeah. Couldn't find it. Five ten minutes later, how does she even find it? It's she like, can't. Well, they're, they're they're like suctioning. They're oh. putting in um, like sterile towels to soak up all the blood yeah. and just tossing them. They're like going through packs and packs of it, and it's then like, eventually she's like, "I can't find the I can't find the bleed." And they just called it, so they couldn't they they couldn't save uh, this gentleman. So, and then thereafter, it, our responsibility afterwards was just to clean everything up. The body was essentially closed, and the body was wheeled to um, the one of the prep room areas where no other patients were. There's no family, and they let the family visit. And I just remembered, I don't know why the mom thought it was a good idea to bring. The kids with her oh, no. i guess it's better than i guess oh, no. they don't really have anyone to care for either yeah so I, i'm guessing it's a child care issue so she brought the two kids with them the two kids were like if i were to guess like probably like grade three grade grade four around there around that age so old enough to obviously understand yeah. what's going on and it was just such it's so traumatic just oh, seeing their parents oh, like, like that it was so bad yeah, the That's worst the is worst. probably like seeing the people. Oh, I I would feel like the worst is if it's something close to you, like close to you, as in your physical build, your physical age, and yeah. all that stuff. Because it's like could have been me or something. Yeah, like yeah. that too. But that's yeah. tough when you see the family. Like, yeah, oh. like that's just, for me. It's like when I see the heartbroken people is when it's the saddest mm-hmm. for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's tough. That's tough. Oh, but that was some cool. That was a cool story because uh, we 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 need more nurses on here. We yeah. need the Your crazy, probably has some good ones. crazy hospital stories and stuff because those are kind of cool, hey? Yeah, that was, that was intense. Yeah, that was very intense. Uh, so okay, I have several thoughts. Uh, I felt like when I was working at the senior center, this didn't really happen to me. So like, people did pass away in the senior center, but for me, I didn't connect too much with any specific one person that didn't make me overwhelmingly sad this was volunteering no this was when i was working at uh the senior oh center right and then i i but i did remember some of my co-workers were like very like they got very close to the people mm-hmm. and i was like oh that's the hardest like i i didn't do it purposely i didn't like not get close to them purposely i i just i was a teen i didn't give a fuck about a lot of things <laughs> so I, I was just doing my job i was like this is a great job. very low give a fuck yeah meter. yeah yeah from the give a shit meter it's, it's pretty low for me yeah once it passes i don't give a shit yeah. anymore but yeah um other thought i had is um do they in nursing school teach you like at a certain point the person will like pass urine and feces and stuff like how do they prepare for that do you like diaper the person up or something or how does that work? You you don't just bother wait for it to come out yeah and, then you just clean and they it? just clean it yeah oh Smell like really some, like I mean, a lot of the patients that if they're in palliative, they yeah. usually do have like briefs. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. So we let so we make our job a little bit easier, but you still have to um, clean the overflow of what happens, right? So I just remember in uh, not related, but in South Park, it was always a running joke. <laughs> 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 it was just like every dead, there's just like a giant shat platter right after. <laughs> okay. Um. So next thing I want to talk about was uh, tragic deaths. So I remember the two deaths in my life that was tragic. I think one of them I talked about it in our last podcast, the one about my uncle. But the other one was about my one friend. Um, when he passed away, I'm not particularly close to him. Like, I'm not that close to this friend. But I've known him, like, since elementary almost, right? Uh, and he's my age. And he passed away in a car accident. Oh. And when that happened, that one affected me so much because... It's one of those moments where I was like, like, that person's just like me, like, you know, like, not so, like, we're, we're both the same age, you know, we were both, like, I'm healthy, he's healthy, it could happen to me too, right? Mm-hmm. And it kind of just, like, that one just put me in a shock, because I'm like, at that moment, it always felt like death was, like, a old person thing. Like, all the people I knew were dying were old, and, you know, it was coming their time and stuff, and it was just, like, death felt like a natural thing that happens, but then after that happened, I was like, whoa like it could be me yeah, like that could have been me or that could have been my best friend or that could have been something whatever. far away in the future yeah like like 
I don't know how to explain it, but as far as it seems, it could always, almost always be at your doorstep, right? Mm -hmm. Like, depending on the situation you are in. And that tragic one, like, really shocks me, right? Like, like, and again, that was an accident. Like, I couldn't even imagine how I would feel if I know someone who was purposefully killed or anything like that, right? Like, I hope I can live to move past it kind of thing, Mm -hmm. but I don't know how much anger or, like, resentment would build up in me if that were to happen when I think about it. If you, if one of your family members were to have a tragic death and they got murdered, yeah, and yeah, you yeah, yeah. Them, oh. yeah, like that would, that would put a shock in my system beyond, uh, yeah. beyond belief. That's for yeah, sure. I've yeah. thought about that before. Like, what if I saw someone murder my sister in front of me? I think I would go ape shit yeah. on them. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Like it's almost like I don't even care if I die at that point. Yeah, I don't even care. You can arrest me. I'm, yeah, I'm gonna make sure this guy suffers. <laughs> Well, you may also die too. Who knows? <laughs> it is what it is. Are you guys afraid of death? That was something I wanted to ask. Like I said, like at at, at a point right now, my fear is not me dying. Is what I leave behind. Like those that that I leave behind. Mm-hmm. Like, do I it, like? I think that's a reasonable fear in itself. Yeah, it's almost like. You don't think it's irrational? What are you gonna no, do? No, I think I think it's perfectly rational. I, I feel like anyone who has kids has that same thought, right? Like no one wants to see a kid like grow up without mm-hmm. someone mm-hmm. dear to them, right? So it's almost like like I'm fortunate where you know nothing. You're not gonna die, so you don't need to relate to <laughs> right. This. I don't relate to this at all, guys. What the fuck are you guys about? Uh, yeah, no, I think it's rational to be not afraid of death itself, but afraid of like what you leave behind when you are gone mm-hmm. because you know it's just like it's it's like what I said before the saddest moment wasn't death itself it was when seeing other people with the broken hearts yeah that really like mm-hmm. hurt me right uh, what for you I definitely see death the same way like I'm not afraid of dying at all Ooh, I just don't want to life. Yeah. suffer I guess if mm-hmm. I were to die totally. but then most mostly that I don't want my parents or my friends or family to be sad if I were to die or my dog but aside from that, I don't really care about me dying. Yeah. So I'm like the same. I want to live forever. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't be like. I think, I purposefully built my life where I won't die. As in, like I won't take uh-huh. any crazy risk. Let's bet. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's let's not bet on that. <laughs> but like, okay, there's like specific things, and I guess people might call me a wuss after this, but. For example, like I have my motorcycle license, but I don't really ride a motorcycle because I've seen a lot of motorcycle death. And it kind of brings that fear into me. So like, am I afraid of dying? Yes and no. Like I'm afraid of creating higher risk than necessary. <laughs> like like if, if I can drive to point A, point B, and I don't have to ride a motorcycle, and riding a motorcycle will increase my chance of death. And I was like, what's the, what's the point? Like, is the thrill worth mm-hmm. it? Mm-hmm. Part of me is like, the thrill's fucking worth it. It's, like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, fucking yeah. fun. Like you don't understand. It's really fun riding a motorcycle. <laughs> But a part of me just thinks, like, it's an unnecessary... Like, so some risk you're willing to take, right? So, like, for example, hey, here's a here's a non-deadly mRNA vaccine that we're going to give you. <laughs> oh, interesting. Oh, no. It's very low risk. What are you okay? relating oh, yeah. this to? Nothing, nothing at all. Hmm. But, um, but a 1% chance some people just aren't even willing to take because it's, it's their life. It's like... It's well, it's, like it's just game up. over, right? Like, yeah. you're not willing to take any even a little chance when it comes to your life, right? So for me, I wouldn't take anything that would, like, adversely affect my life. Even though every day I'm betting on my life because I'm driving to work, right? Yeah. Like, like, driving itself is already something dangerous. But I feel like I'm so desensitized that, that like, I'm willing to travel and play, I'm willing to drive a car. But specific things I know I can control. Because I feel like I can't control the fact that I need to get from point A to point B. Like, yeah. that's just, like, you can't shelter yourself so much in life where you don't do that right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but certain things like riding a motorcycle i didn't do it anymore because i knew how dangerous it was yeah. because i've heard of so many like i've had friends who had accidents before and i've heard of so many things where i'm like you know maybe this ain't worth it guys right or like like sometimes like drugs like sometimes i'm like man like i want to do a bunch of drugs not uh not like for not Tylenol and, and, uh, <laughs> like like for example like, what you're like, like, <laughs> like like okay like DMT or like all those other drugs like those or like e- even just to try it just to experience like 
just experience, I don't know, like, cocaine or, like, ecstasy mm-hmm. or something like that. The psychedelic. But, but, but my biggest fear is if it was laced or something, right? Oh. So that's why I, like, don't do it as much. Like, there's some that I'm very okay with, but, like, <laughs> that's because of the sources I trust. Uh, but, like, because of that risk, I'm more, like, risk-averse where I'm like, okay, I'm not going to do it, and, like, I don't care how reliable that person is. I've never done this before. I don't know how it's going to be, right? That's true. I would be way more pissed off if I took a drug and it made me brain dead or I was uh, As a handicapped. You'd be pissed off. You wouldn't be able to think. In some way. Totally. Oh. And you're like, just kill me. Please. Yeah. <laughs> this is not the so, goal. So, I don't know. It's, it's hard to explain because like, I do want to live forever and that's, again, for selfish reasons because I want to try everything in life. But at the same time, I don't want to try everything in life because some of them will kill me. Ooh. Right? So, but I also want to live forever because I feel like I don't know, it's so weird. I feel like I'm duty-bound, or maybe religion-bound, or something bound where if there is something I'm doing that's shortening my lifespan, that's the same as suicide in my mind. Oh. It's like if there's something... Okay, so like in all religion, I think the same as your research, suicide is bad. Mm. Suicide is really bad. Uh, morally, ethically, like, like all these things, it's just bad, right? Like I understand and I empathize for some people who have to, who get to that point because it, it sucks because they're probably in a really low point in their lives, right? But mm. it's just bad in general. There's always different things you can do. Um... But in my mind, it's like if I do anything that I know has a high risk and has a higher chance for me to shorten my life, then to me, it's almost like similar to writing my own will for suicide, right? If that kind of makes sense. Like, like mm. I'm opening it up for myself. So it's like I don't, I don't smoke cigarettes because I think cigarettes yeah. is prone to causing a bunch of cancer stuff. I don't drink that much just because, again, that's prone to causing certain things mm-hmm. with chronic use. So... I try to live forever. I think longevity, a bit of it for me is the thought of one, I want to do a lot of things, but the other thought is I feel religion or duty bound to not try to shorten my life, which is in my opinion, the reverse. So if I live longer, that's even better. Like I'm trying yeah. to actually improve mm-hmm. it. Right. Um, that's probably like a small percentage. It's like 20% of my mind's thinking about it. the other 80% is like, Oh, I want to try this. I want to try this. I want to try this. There's so there's not enough time in life. So if I can ex- extend life i can do all these different things right mm-hmm. but i don't know it's a hard question like i'm afraid of death yes and no like like i'm i feel like it'd be really really sad for for my family mm-hmm. but i don't really have kids i don't have a wife so it's like i'm not leaving them in a fu- super vulnerable situation like i have mm-hmm. a dog but i'd be pretty sad for him i'd, I'd be pretty sad if he passed away too right like if, yeah. if like, I actually didn't realize until I got my own pet, like, how sad it is when your pet passed away. Like, just yeah, imagine just, now, yeah. I'm just like, <sighs> like, I gotta take, like, a couple of days off, guys. Like, this ain't For something sure. I yeah. can just get through. Before I had a pet, I could never sympathize with my friends growing up. Whenever any of my friends' dogs pass away, I would just think, oh, it's the freaking pet. It's not a big deal. Because I had fish. And when my fish passed away, I, I was I would just think like, oh, I'm just gonna buy a new one. It's not a big deal. <laughs> so whenever I would see my friends talk about their dogs passing away, I would I would not be able to sympathize at all. I would see it the same way like, why 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 are you crying? Why do you go get a new dog. Why do you think there's a difference? Like if you have pet fish versus a pet dog. To me, at when I was growing up, it was literally just, just a pet. A pet. Oh. And I thought you have a pet dog. But right now, though, let's, if you were if you were to have a pet fish now. But now I have a pet dog now, and then, so I think. I'm not sure if I would still sympathize the same way with a fish, but I have a pet dog now, and I treat her like she's, like, my daughter. <laughs> so if, like, I spoil the shit out of her. And if she were to pass away, I would definitely need a few days off, too, and I would cry all over the place. You know, for some reason, I was thinking about, I think there was a Simpsons episode where he had a pet lobster. Ooh, I that. <laughs> oh, I remember Oh, my God. And he had a really, really warm back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. No, no, when you're talking about pet fish, I was like, hmm, what happens if you have a pet lobster? I wonder Did how you know, know, fun fact, recently, uh, I think it was Europe. Europe just passed a law that said that lobsters, shrimp, and crabs are sentient beings. Aren't, so now there's laws protecting them. Aren't all really? animals sentient beings? That's what they That's what they thought, but then th- for crustaceans and fish and all that stuff, they weren't necessarily classified as sentient oh. beings. Really? Because they didn't know whether they felt... Pain, pain or not or anything oh. but they did a lot of tests and they would like cut off one of the receptors or put salt or some sort of chemical near the antenna of a lobster and then they would look at it and see if the lobster would touch its antenna or like try and heal its wound or try and tend to its wound and it did do that and then 
from all the studies, they found out that, yes, lobsters, crabs, and shrimp, they do feel pain. Or they feel some sort of pain. Or when they're wounded, they do know that they're wounded. And huh. they do care. I feel and like they do try and help I themselves. Feel like fishes feel that way too. I don't know. Like in but that, this is, you know, this is like a few days old. Like in Buddhism, like everything is sent. Like yeah. all animals yeah. are sentient. So that's how we felt about it. I actually had a, a really interesting question to my master back in the day before he passed away. I, I don't know. Like when I was a kid, I had thought of all these creatures in there. And I thought of like, okay, like if I bought a, bought this pack of paper, mm-hmm. this paper is made from a tree. But the guy cutting down the tree killed a nest of birds. Uh-huh. By proxy, am I killing those birds? Uh-huh. Because I had to buy the paper for it, right? But I think at some point, if you keep thinking you like that, like at, at some point, you keep thinking like that, you're always killing something by buying anything. Yeah. Right? So it's kind of like impossible to live a life like that. So then it, like he kind of like, you know, said like, no, that's not like it's proxy is too hard. Like yeah. you can't proxy everything. So it's kind of like... No, Alvin, don't go and shoot an arrow at that cow, but <laughs> but it's okay to buy paper because, you know, But it's okay to buy beef from that farm. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, meat is not killing. It's, uh, okay, it, it's a weird thing. I think I, I think it is in Buddhism where it's like, um, Buddha himself would eat meat, but he wouldn't kill the animal. But if you just left the meat there, it would rot and waste. And mm. that's, like, that's also bad. You don't want to like waste things, right? That's also one of the things of Buddha is like not wasting things, right? Just imagine Buddha when he was like young and young and uh, young and very much alive. <laughs> he just sees a cow dying in a field. He's like, "Oh, I'm gonna get burgers in a few days." <laughs> 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 you did. Was, yeah. was that way? You come no way. <laughs> Having to see like a whole bunch of cows in a field. Oh, I'm just gonna chuck this rock really far. <laughs> I feel a bit hungry. Um, I could use a steak in a few days. Yeah, shut the fuck up. He's enlightened, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and so I guess going now back to full circles, back to the whole the funeral thing. I actually kind of like, not only because of the coffin dance thing, mm-hmm. but I actually liked it when I have saw, I've seen like obituaries and I've seen like ceremony and stuff where they make it a lot more lighthearted. And they make it more fun and stuff, like mm-hmm. like a legitimate celebration of life. And I always thought that was such a cool way. Like I get it, we should be like crazy sad and all that stuff that someone great or some whoever passed away and stuff. But I always think back, like if that was me, and I could like see them from above, like in the ceiling, you know, and just like fucking <laughs> just looking down, yeah, just, <laughs> just, 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 just my ghostly <laughs> self in the ceiling looking down. Alvin doesn't go to heaven. <laughs> I stay with the boiler room ghost. (laughs) And the cat is strong in him. But if I could actually see my family and stuff after, I would always want them to be like okay with it. Like, (laughs) imagine your family doesn't even hold (laughs) you. Oh shit, he's gone. What do you want to do with the room? Feed him to the fishes, boys. (laughs) But yeah, like, like, you be happy with that. Like, I, Come I, on, guys, cry a little. Knock, yeah. on, knock on wood. <laughs> knock on wood. It doesn't Parents bother go me that much. That day. <laughs> no, no. Knock on wood. It doesn't bother me that much as long as I'm cremated, because that's how my religious mm-hmm. belief is. But anyways, I I would always imagine if I'm in like that ghostly state, or if I could look down on it, I would really hope that you know they would show a sign that they're moving on. And I feel like that's like the best sign is like. Or don't even show a sign. It's like... They're unpacking... They're packing up your room right away. <laughs> moving new furniture in. Uh, well, I was just thinking like... It's it's almost like... A celebration of the accomplishments. Rather than a morning of the passing. Right? Mm. Like, I would hope to accomplish enough in my life. Where people can be like, wow. This person was a good person. Right? Mm-hmm. And we want to celebrate this good person. It sucks we lost a good person. But... We would like to celebrate the good things this person did, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's almost like I want my life to go beyond my physical body into the achievements I've created, Mm. right? Like, I'm not trying to attempt to be like a, like an Elon Musk or anything like that, or I'm not trying to like, you know, save the world or anything like that. But at the end of the day, I just want people to know like, Hey, the reflection of me, what is a show? And I actually had a thought experiment, or this is kind of one of the books I was reading about. Uh, I kind of want to share with you guys and let you guys think about this a bit. But pretty much the the experiment is, like, whoever you want to be, how you have to think about it is, like, what do you want written in your obituary, right? 
So say if you want your obituary, say this person is courageous, this person's ethical, or this person's a charitable person, right? Mm-hmm. The only way to get to that point and say that's the end goal, that's the end point, right? Like if that's the final boss and this is what you want at the very end of day, saving the princess or whatever, like this is the end goal of what all of our lives should be, then you have to start that now, right? Like okay. you can't you can't start that age seventy and mm-hmm. expect the last seventy years to not count, and then the last ten years to be your obituary. Your obituary has to be a, a compilation of your life, right? Yeah. So it's it's almost the thought experience the the book was talking about is like, how to become a better person is like you have to first think of what do you want to be an obituary? What do you want to be known for? What what do you want? Like if you want to be known for being a really rich guy, that's perfectly fine. It's like I'll, everyone's different, right? Mm-hmm. But whatever you want to be. You can't think of, I'll do it later. You mm-hmm. almost have to think about, that's what you have to do every time you come up to like a hard decision. Like if you come up to like, if your goal is to be a very honest person, for example, right? And you come up to a hard decision, like at work, to be like ethical or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Like that obituary of saying, I want to be an honest person should trump whatever other decisions you have to make at that point, right? Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like a thought experiment that they gave in a book. And I was like, oh, that's so cool because it's like all your ethical thoughts should be justified by your end goal so you should almost already think like okay if i want to not be a dick then don't be a dick don't be a dick <laughs> right but like sometimes you're put in situations where it's not an easy answer right mm-hmm. but then at the end of the day discount all the money and stuff like it's really what you want like at your obit- like if you start thinking from the end backwards then you can really build what you want to create which is like as lo- as much as I want to live forever, I will have no. I may have a new picture one day. Does that hurt to say? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I need to think about what kind of person I want to be, right? And if I don't start being that person now, then there is no like you can't just say tomorrow to these things, almost mm-hmm. right? Like it has to happen. So it was kind of a cool experiment, and, and I want to bring up in this in this same discussion because like even for our listeners out there, it's like it's kind of cool because. Even though we're talking about death and stuff, I wanted to think about the celebration, the obituary, the achievements, and use that as kind of a more of a cheerful side of it, right? Because mm-hmm. because I've heard of some of these before, and some of them are so cool and nice. And it's not just hearing about it, but also seeing the people say it afterwards. It's like, wow, this person was a great person. Like, it doesn't matter if I knew this person or not. From other people, I know this is a great person because of the because of the the feelings they created for other people. So yeah, that was that was kind of my thought of why I think, you know, death... One, I think we had a lot of fun, but the other thing is, like, I think it can be a more cheerful thing, but I guess it's kind of perspective. Because, like, I say it now, but when it comes to me, if someone close to me passed away, I for sure would be sad, right? Yeah. But in my thoughts, I'm always like, what if I was that person and I passed away? What do I want to see? I do want to see a celebration of my life rather than everyone just crying all the time, right? I want to see people... It sounds selfish, but I want people to know what my achievements are because I'm working my life towards that, mm-hmm. right? And I, I, I kind of wish people thought of that more so. Because, like, like I said, at the point of the funeral or whatever, this, it's not reversible. Like, nothing, nothing can change. The person's already passed away. I know it's a very naive and logical way of thinking about it. Mm-hmm. But I also think if we think like that and we think of more of how do we celebrate this person, then I feel like it will help people be more okay with it. Yeah, it would definitely make the funeral process a lot easier. I remember, like, at my grandmother's funeral, although the s- cremation part was extremely sad, afterwards at the, is it called banquet? Or whatever happens afterwards when they have food, they wanted to actually celebrate her life instead yeah. of talking about the bad times. Yeah. So there were people playing songs, yeah. and there was, like, lively music on and really good food yeah. and the only pictures on the slideshow were like silly pictures yeah. mm-hmm. and even though you would think it would be really sad a lot of people were actually laughing and sharing yeah. the fun moments that they had with my grandma yeah and the fun the memories they had and i was surprised no one was crying mm-hmm. there it's it's so cool because it's almost like she was with you guys at that party yeah, yeah. like this is her last party kind mm-hmm. of yeah that's so cool like i i don't know i just think that that's such a uplifting version or of yeah, how yeah. it should be right like, especially this month where it's, like, depression month. And I know a lot of people are going to go through a lot of tough times. Mm-hmm. Um, not saying, like, go kill yourself. Or anything like that. <laughs> like, I'm not saying doing anything rash, guys. But I'm just saying, like, even in something so sad and cruel and stuff, I feel, I wish people can, like, 
kind of change the perspective and it will change the outcome quite a bit right mm-hmm. so what you were saying earlier about what you want in your obituary i find that kind of interesting because that's kind of how i apply myself in everyday life not by thinking about what i want in my obituary but what kind of person i want to be yeah mm-hmm. and what kind of person you want to be and what characteristics you want for yourself you kind of have to show up as that every single day yes and then if you show up as that, then eventually that will become a habit. And then that will become who you are. And you have to continuously practice that habit. So that's what, something that I do every day, which kind of relates to your obituary thing that I yeah. thought was interesting. Yeah, it, it relates, yeah. Because it's pretty much the same concept. It's just mine is like thinking in terms of timeline, but yours is thinking about end goal again. It's the yeah, same thing, like right? Who, like who, who, you who do be? I want to be at yeah. the end of the day yeah. or end of my life? I don't know. I just thought like it's a super cool thought experiment because I'll be honest, I want to be more selfless but i don't see myself being like you know the world's best philanthropist or anything like that Mm -hmm. right but in my version of it for example i would want to be selfless in terms of i want to like use my time for something good right as like like that's my version of care not giving money but rather giving time Mm -hmm. and then my version of like i want to be like an ethical person i want to you know devote myself to science and knowledge so like that's why i try to recreate myself too right so but it's cool because it's um like it it's almost like like a reminder for people especially when they go through like a really hard decision like Mm -hmm. here's a reminder what do you actually want to be right and if you don't do that now it's just a snowball like it's just gonna be downhill right like if you make that one unethical choice just for one small gain or whatever gain yeah who's to say that you're not gonna make the same choice next time Mm -hmm. and if you're gonna make the same choice next time it's gonna be this it's, it's gonna be there forever right you have to kind of be your own QA yeah yeah true Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that was like I don't know. I thought this was a fun conversation. Any last things you guys want to add in? I have one more. Yeah, story. Go ahead. Let's do it. Let's, Let's do it. One for the road. This is like second hand though. I wasn't there. Okay. But uh, it's pr- it's it was obviously very traumatic. But just let me know how you would feel as the parent. So basically, um, a husband and wife show up to the hospital this is before pandemic happened they the the wife needed to be admitted to do some gynecological um surgery so like surgery f- dealing with the um female reproductive system okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah sounds sounds right and uh because so it was scheduled it was diagnosed and scheduled for a long time like it, like three to four weeks in this this person was admitted and um, because of the pandemic, everything got pushed back. So it got pushed back for like six months because of the pandemic. Holy cow. There was closures of ORs because they need the ORs uh, or the recovery room for ICU space. So a lot of things happened, a lot of factors happened causing this um, person's surgery to be delayed for six months. The ORs started opening up after six months and they do the surgery. Um, for this individual, and they had to take out the the woman's uterus. Mm-hmm. When they took out, when they operated the on this woman, um, they pretty much devacu- devascularized the uterus. So, like, pretty much attaching the uterus from the woman's body, taking out <sighs> all the tissue. That can happen. And yeah, that's what they're supposed to do when they need to wait, extract it, right? Wait, when you uh, neuter a female dog. I don't think that's the same. Uh, <laughs> okay. Take up the uterus. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, no, right. not the same. But uh, yeah, so they devascularized the uterus. They took the uterus out, yeah. and they discovered that the that the person that the woman was actually pregnant. Twenty <gasps> three week old baby was still in the uterus. So there's a lot of factors leading up oh to that God. that caused like the. Like there's like when, can wait can they when put it back someone? In? No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, so there's a lot of things that they do to prevent this, right? So in the beginning, when uh, any any person that can bear a child, they usually ask, "Is there a chance that you're pregnant?" So when she first came in, she didn't realize she was pregnant. At that time, she said, "No, I, it's not possible. I'm not pregnant." So for the six months leading up to the surgery. She had no idea and never, no one ever asked her or reassessed her or made her take a pregnancy test. So when they took the womb out, the baby oh. was in there. And obviously, the dad didn't know, 
the patient herself didn't know, and in this very moment, the whole OR basically was hysterical. Like everyone was crying, everyone was so devastated that this happened. They took the, they extracted the baby from the uterus, and they called up one of the uh, peds um, uh, doctors and basically asked if this would be a viable baby, a neonate at this point. And 23 weeks is really, really slim. Like there are children that. Uh, that make it, but a, a lot of times they have a lot of bad health outcomes yeah. thereafter. But um, in this scenario, is it's still ongoing. Like this is an actual thing that's happening, and okay. there's still lots of things happening in the background. But if you were the parents hearing this for the first time, like what would you like? How would you feel? Wait, was the woman must have been fat, right? For, no, like 23 I, weeks is not no not quite, everyone shows 23 weeks is very young yeah. it's oh very, wait wait what's nine like, months what's like... nine months and weeks <laughs> hold up wait 52 is a year minus three like months that's that's nine three. 12 that's 40 40, 40, 40 yeah, weeks 40, 40, 40 weeks, weeks is yeah. like actual that's halfway halfway but there's a like a growth it's spurt like yeah like, like near the end right but in the beginning it's not that, that scares me it's like an alien in your body um, I don't know actually as a parent because you're not even pl- like this is a, like, it's, a this is an accidental you baby, have a baby. Anyway. yeah yeah I know but like how do you how do you like how would you mourn in that situation like for the death of your child that you didn't even realize you had would you would I, I don't like know. would you even go through the process of so, mourning like like you regularly I, 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 wait I think wait here's a nuance first mine and Viv's answer should almost not count because we don't even have kids. It's true. Yeah. So, like, we don't even actually even know what it is to but have these, a live but, one. But that's what's so realistic about the scenario yeah. is that they weren't parents. They never had kids either. This was, like, their oh. young couple. You know oh. what I'm saying? Like, so I'm they thinking, never had if this kids. happened to me, I feel like I would be kind of sad. It's kind of like a bittersweet feeling. I would, I would think, oh, <laughs> oh crap. Like, oh, plan C. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing you got that. <laughs> that wasn't good. I wasn't ready. <laughs> Clearly. But I would think if I saw my baby that was however many weeks old and was going to die, I would be like, holy shit, we had a baby this whole time. What if you cheated on it? Think about all the drugs that we did. <laughs> Dude, oh all my the drugs. God. Oh yeah, all the drinking right? you would have... Oh, I'd be like, you were plan Z right there, man. Give me a but if it was supposedly supposed to be a really healthy baby, I would think, oh my god, we fucked up. But at the same time, I don't think I would be that upset. I would have a moment where I w- where I would be like, Isn't oh, that's really unfortunate. We had a little family, we didn't even know about it. But at the same time, if I knew I was pregnant, I would get an abortion right away. Or I would definitely take a plan B pill. At, at so our current I, age. Yeah, at yeah. my current age and yeah. in my current situation, I would definitely just be like, well... Ain't my problem now. That's sad. That's pretty sad, but... uh, I I don't know. Thanks for catching that. (laughs) (laughs) Great job. I think, isn't it... Isn't the biggest heartbreak of, like, a stillbirth is the expectation? Like, the expectation is what hurts the most, right? Because you're expecting... I mean, some people really want kids, too. Yeah, but, like... Born means a lot to them. And that's the fucked up part about this story is that she can't have another baby. Oh, Um, yeah. Right? The uterus is out. So like they all, uh, I feel like that surrogate moment. Yeah, you could. Like, I guess. Maybe she made a deal with the devil. She had sacrificed the first newborn or the first and the uterus. Yeah. I don't know. How would you feel if that happened to you and your wife? I think I'd be so. Even though I. Like obviously, the couple knew going into this that they wouldn't have a kid, right? Yeah. The. If the surgery is to remove the uterus of, of, of yeah, the wife. There's no so, expectation there's no for expectations. There's no expectations, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But the fact that this is absolutely 100% preventable. If, they could have, yeah. I guess there is, like, there was growth and in, in a tumor in, in, the, in the woman's uterus, so that's why they need to remove it. So the, it's not like it's, it was a healthy individual, like, ha- like an mm-hmm. accident that happened. So I don't know. I, I would probably feel at first pretty, pretty pissed, I'd say. Could you imagine if this woman, especially because the surgery was delayed for so long, yeah. delayed for so yeah. long? Well, no, I was just gonna say, like, could you imagine if this woman believes in like 
like star signs and shit and then she's like fuck because it was delayed and all this stuff and you know all these like random it's not meant stuff. to be <laughs> my leo yeah. is in rising yeah, 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 <laughs> shit like that. but yeah i don't know like yeah if it didn't get delayed it wouldn't even get to this point but regardless of the point at the end of the day she wouldn't have a kid either right like mm-hmm. if she if it didn't get delayed she wouldn't have a kid and then if it did get delayed she still is gonna have a kid mm-hmm. So, I don't know, like, I guess... Maybe yeah. that, that would have been, like, to her really sad if she actually really wanted a kid. I know. If she had a chance yeah. at her yeah. first part. So, so the backstory I wonder was. if, legally, they probably have to tell her, right? They had to, they told her. Oh. After <laughs> well, I'm just thinking, yeah. like, For like sure. if they didn't <laughs> tell her, <laughs> why did they tell her? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking, you're like... Yeah, kiss this one under wraps. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This one is definitely going to get like, me fired. It's like you have that one fact that's going to fuck up someone's day, and you're like, do I tell them or do I not tell them? <laughs> I don't tell them. I feel, a little, I feel like a dick for not telling them the truth, but if I do tell them, I'd absolutely ruin their day, right? Yeah. This is kind of that that's scenario. True. Yeah. I don't um, know, man. I would do some cartoony shit and not <laughs> say it. But I don't think that's legally allowed. So. How would you feel if that happened to you? Uh, to my wife? Yeah. My potential wife in the future? Um, If I really want kids, I, I'd be pretty sad. But if I really want kids, then they're going to get rid of her uterus. Like, there's no chance anyways, right? But at least you like, oh, a biological yeah. kid. Yeah. And that by chance, there's... People, yeah. yeah. I mean, like... Wait, in, no, no, but... Realistically, though, like, if... They didn't take up the uterus. That baby probably could have made it. Right. Is okay. what they were saying. But prior to this, I would have had to get myself mentally prepared that I'm never going to have a kid without a surrogate with my wife because I'm getting rid of Or you are removing the uterus for some medical reason, right? So I would have already been mentally prepared to say, like, okay, I cannot get a kid by normal intercourse. Mm-hmm. So then it's like, then my expectations are pretty low, then if you tell me, oh, we lost a kid that you thought you would never have. Fuck. And I'm like, <laughs> Shit. But then... Wow. His life. Like, I don't know. I feel like they must have been mentally prepared to not have a kid, right? I but, think so too. I'd be curious as to know. But it must have been sad for, like, I'm sure everyone mm. working in the OR was a parent at one point, yeah. so they were been like, oh, shit. Yeah, and apparently the um, PED uh, physician that they brought up to the OR just didn't even bother trying to resuscitate oh. the baby. I just because they were just not confident that this baby would have a good yeah. outcome. Yeah. So they just I just slowly just step away. Look yeah. at the baby was like and apparently they described <laughs> it as the baby fitting in a like a K basin. So like oh. a kidney basin. Oh. Oh. Very small. I'd be like I ain't touching that with a forty foot pole guys. <laughs> <laughs> this ain't my problem now. Forty foot pole. Sorry, it's lunch time for me. <laughs> uh Okay, well, anyways, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in this week. Uh, it was a fun podcast about death. Yeah. I think I think we could we we spun it a bit. We didn't make it, you know, very sad and cruel. I think it's kind of hard to make death really sad and cruel. What do you mean? I thought oh, it'd be okay, very easy. That'd be easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> you, you, guys want, you guys want a really sad death? Watch watch Final Space Season 3. Oh, That's my it. God. It was really sad. Very sad, very sad. But anyways, uh, not to ruin everyone's uh, Final Space experience. Um, we're going <laughs> to... I'm going to wrap this podcast up. Uh, thanks you guys for tuning in uh don't forget to like comment and subscribe yeah and uh, if you guys want to be on this podcast or have any ideas for topics in the future please drop us a comment or send uh, either myself jorge or viv a message and uh, we will try to get that in on the next podcast also if you want to be a guest let us know we're uh we're interested to get a variety of guests on this show like today we found out nurses have some really cool stories that i'm very interested about Mm -hmm. Uh, so i guess we got a find a nurse next time or a, or a doctor maybe or something Ooh. something cool like the other week we had someone in the military he had cool stories yet to be released yeah and then uh i don't know i don't know what's next a deep sea diver a fisherman a st- astronaut who knows where this well, podcast will go i would go. love to talk to an astronaut yeah I'll threaten him to give me his job <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> anyways Thanks for tuning in, guys. Thank Thank you. you. See ya.